Now a House oversight hearing on White House email archives, including efforts to recover thousands of lost emails and allegations that White House officials used Republican National Committee email addresses to avoid the Presidential Records Act. Henry Waxman of California is the chairman. This is 3 hours and 15 minutes. Uh, good morning. The committee will please come to order. Today's hearing focuses on whether President Bush and the White House are complying with the Presidential Records Act. The Presidential Records Act was enacted in 1978 to ensure that White House records are preserved for history and are owned by the American people. It requires the President to preserve the records that document the activities, deliberations, decisions and policies of the White House. The emergence and remarkable surge in popularity of email has presented problems in complying with the act. As members of this committee know, President Clinton experienced these problems. In 1994, he established the automated records management system to archive presidential records, including emails. But the system had technical flaws. For a period of time, it would not preserve emails sent by officials whose, na whose name began with the letter D. Well, in 2000, Dan Burton, who was then chair of this committee, alleged that the Clinton administration deliberately lost and withheld emails from Congress. Mr. Burton held five hearings on that issue and forced the White House to spend over $11 million to reconstruct 200,000 emails. In the end, the overblown charges of wrongdoing were proven false. The lost emails turned out to be the result of a few technical glitches, not any intentional acts. The silver lining to the committee's investigation, though, was that the problems in the automatic records management system were addressed. When President Clinton left office and President Bush came into office, the White House had in place a, a system for archiving White House emails that complied with the Presidential Records Act. That's what makes the actions of the Bush administration so inexplicable. President Bush's White House kept the automatic records management system in 2001. But in September 2002, for reasons that we have never found an adequate explanation, the Bush administration White House decided to replace the automatic records management system. In its place, the White House adopted a system that one of its own experts described as primitive and carried a high risk that data would be lost. The system also had serious security flaws. Until the problem was corrected in 2005, all officials in the White House had access to the archive system and the ability to delete or alter existing information. The White House's own analysis of its system identified over 700 days in which email records seem either impossibly low or completely non-existent. This 2005 analysis was prepared by a team of 15 White House officials and contractors. And these are not the only mis missing emails from the White House. We also know that over 80 White House officials, including some of the most senior officials in the White House, routinely used email accounts at the Republican National Committee. The RNC didn't preserve emails for over 50 of these officials and has few emails for any White House officials prior to 2006. The result is a potentially enormous gap in the historical record. Karl Rove, the President's closest political advisor, was a prolific user of his RNC email account. Yet the RNC preserved virtually none of his emails before 2004. The result is that we may never know what he wrote about the buildup to the Iraq War. In recent weeks, the White House has launched an all-out attack on its own analysis of the missing emails, 
One White House spokesman tried to claim that there were no e missing emails after all. Another senior, senior White House official said she had serious reservations about the accuracy of the White House's previous work and that she had, quote, quote, so far been unable to replicate its results or to affirm the correctness of its assumptions underlying it, end quote. Well, many of us have grown used to the White House attacking any congressional or independent study that conflicts with President Bush's policies. This is the first time I can remember the White House using those same tactics on itself, and it's remarkable. But that's not all. The White House is also refusing to cooperate with the National Archives. For almost a year, the nonpartisan National Archives has been urging the Bush White House to assess the problem of missing emails and to take whatever action may be necessary to restore any missing emails. The lack of cooperation became so severe that last May, the archivist himself wrote to the White House counsel, Fred Fielding, to urge, quote, utmost dispatch, end quote, in addressing the missing emails. Yet in September 2007, the Archives General Counsel drafted a memo summarizing the White House's decision to ignore the request of the archivist. He wrote, quote, we still have made almost zero progress in actually moving ahead with the important and necessary work that is required for a successful transition. Our repeated requests have gone unheeded. Of most importance, we still know virtually nothing about the status of the alleged missing White House emails, end quote. The archives also asked the White House to start recovering official emails that the Republican National Committee deleted pursuant to its policy of regularly purging emails from its servers. These repeated requests have also been rebuffed. In fact, the RNC has informed our committee that it has no intention of trying to restore the missing White House emails from backup tapes containing past RNC email records. My staff has prepared an extensive memorandum that summarizes what we have learned through our investigation into the missing e White House emails so far. And I ask that this memorandum and the documents it cites be made part of the hearing record. I also Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I object. Uh, reserving the right to object. Uh, the right to object. Gentleman uh, is recognized on his reservation. Mr. Chairman, apparently the memo cites uh, an interrogatory from a, uh, a gentleman, uh, Mr. McDevitt, and uh, I object uh, because those interrogatories appear to have been essentially adopted in lieu of, of testimony because they, they appear to support the majority and by definition, if they're allowed to come into the record, what we're effectively doing is uh, preventing the minority from having an opportunity to, uh, to openly challenge what seem to be, uh, to us, inconsistent and self-serving statements. The, uh, <clears throat> the fact is that we'd like to have a clear hearing, a clear understanding. We want to have all parties that may have something to say, not only say it, but be open to reasonable cross-examination. So, uh, if, if the gentleman would permit, let me give you a clear understanding of what happened. The White House objected to our doing an interview with this, with this person. Uh, they suggested we do a set of interrogatories. We proceeded on a bipartisan basis at the staff level to do exactly that. We now seek to make this information public. I know that the Republicans now would say, well, we'd like to have an, inter we'd like to have a, a, an inter interview or deposition. But we follow the rules. And that's, uh, and that's what we're uh, seeking today, is to disclose what we have so, so far in following the rules. If the gentleman objects, he objects, and we'll have to have a vote of the committee at some point during the hearing. But as I understand, Mr. Davis does not object, uh, and I'll yield to him if he does. Uh, yeah. but well, what we do obj object is putting the interrogatories uh, in their entirety into the record be for, for several reasons. Um, and our staffs have talked about this. Uh, just as we do with all investigations, all non-White House employees involved have been required to sit for transcribed interviews or deposition 
but Mr. McDevitt was not. Uh, the White House's concerns were no different for his testimony than for other witnesses that were put under that, but somehow the majority was most accommodating to Mr. McDevitt. We were wondering whether Mr. McDevitt was able to avoid an on-the-record interview because he supplied a version of the story that pleased the majority uh, that was critical of the White House, and that was our concern. The White House's concerns were no different for his testimony than for other witnesses. Um, from 2002 to 2006, Mr. McDevitt was responsible for managing the White House's email archiving system. In his opinion, 400-plus days of White House emails went missing. This sensational charge is not supported by the evidence that we have gathered. Though the course of the investigation... Mr. Uh, Davis, yes, uh, but Mr. It, Davis it, let, me, let me interrupt you, and, sure. and I'm going to give you a full opportunity to, to debate this question. But uh, I want to respond, and then we'll get further sure. along with this. If there's objection, there's objection. We won't include it in the record at this point, but we will on a vote of the committee. Uh, evidently, the Republicans are unhappy that Mr. McDevitt, who worked at the White House, uh, gave testimony they didn't like. But we follow the rules that the White House set out, and the Republicans were happy for us to follow those rules. And now that they read the testimony, they would like to impeach. They would like to impeach the fellow from the White House who said things that they didn't like. Well, he's no longer at the White House. Pardon? He's no longer there. He's no longer at the White House. That's but correct. Uh, it, we, it. The in White fact, House did not want him to sit for, uh, sit for a, a deposition. And that's why uh, we did what we did. Ms. Payton uh, did not have a, an interview, as the Republicans are asking, that we should have had for Mr. McDevitt. But the chair will move on and declare that this will not be part of the record by unanimous consent, and will renew the debate and action by the committee at, at an appropriate time on a motion uh, to make this uh, part of the record. Mr. So, Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman point, of, point of inquiry. Chairman, uh, does, that, does that mean agree. that you're withdrawing your unanimous consent at this at time? This time. Uh, I will withdraw my unanimous consent. Just a minute. I am withdrawing my unanimous consent request just as it pertains to the interrogatories from Mr. McDevitt. So you're now moving that sans the, the references to the interrogatories, the rest would go forward? Yeah. Which is normal committee practice. I mean, you could, generally the- Is there the objection? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, I will Can you finish your statement, Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes. Can but you finish your statement and then well, on I'll our time my statement. you can We're question? We're going to put in the information except for the interrogatory. Mr. Chairman, Mr. I, uh, concluding my time, because we were all speaking, I guess, on my time. Is there so, an objection? Mr. Chairman, reserving. Chairman, I would only Mr. like to clarify that the minority uh, did not sign off, uh, so it was not a bipartisan uh, procedure. That is not a proper uh, uh, reservation. If either you're for letting this go in the record, as Mr. Davis has suggested we do as ordinary committee uh, activities, without reference. without reference to the interrogators, or you agree to it, I give us your, uh, you have a reservation, give us your uh, withholding of unanimous consent request or agreement to the unanimous consent request. Without that, you, I agree. Okay. They, and that, uh, with, that will be part of the uh, record. Now, that I'd like to continue with my opening statement. We have this extensive memorandum that summarizes what we've learned through our investigation into the missing e White House emails. And I also urge members and the public to review this memorandum carefully. Email archiving, by its nature, is a complex and technical subject. The memorandum provides a guide to what we have learned from our interviews of White House officials and our review of over 20,000 pages of internal White House and archive documents. That's now in this record. I'm determined not to make the same mistakes some of my Republican colleagues made eight years ago. I don't want to jump to any conclusions or make any sensational allegations of wrongdoing without any evidence. At the same time, the White House's actions make absolutely no sense. There's an old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But that's exactly what the Bush White House did to the automated record system. It had a system that archives its emails, and it intentionally dismantled an effective system and replaced it with a primitive alternative that just didn't work. It initiated its own study of missing emails in 2005 and now derisively attacks its own work as incompetent and grossly inaccurate. It has continually resisted not just the efforts of this committee, 
but also those of the National Archives, which has the responsibility to carry out the Presidential Records Act. Well, none of this makes any sense, which is why we're holding this hearing today and why this hearing is so important. So I look forward to what our witnesses have to say so that we can finally start making progress on this important open government issue. And the Chair would now like to recognize Mr. Davis. Um, for no, his thank you, Mr. Statement. Chairman. Let me, let me say at the front, I think the committee is entitled to the emails and we want to work with you to get them absent some showing of privilege, which they have not come forward with yet because they can't seem to find them. So I don't think there is any disagreement on our wanting to be able to get to that. It is the characterizations which we uh, differ in our opinion. Uh, just to, to, to dwell on Mr. McDevitt for a minute and why we feel as passionate as we do about that, this from 2002 to 2006 he was responsible for managing the White House's email archiving system. In his opinion, 400 plus days of White House emails went missing, but this sensational charge is not supported by the evidence that we have gathered. Through the course of this investigation, we have learned that many of these so-called missing emails were simply uh, misfiled. On Tuesday of last week, a majority issued a set of 47 interrogatories to Mr. McDevitt, and uh, three days later he's replied with 25 pages of responses, a very quick turnaround indeed, unless he'd been supplied with the questions uh, ahead of time. His robust response is based on dated information since he left the White House approximately 18 months ago. A lot of facts about these so-called missing emails have changed and continue to change. Our staff has really not had the opportunity to examine Mr. McDevitt on the record under oath and consequently his interrogatory responses if entered into the record as is would remain unchallenged and that is not appropriate. Uh, we spoke with Mr. McDevitt on Sunday afternoon. He remains unusually passionate about his time at the White House Office of Administration. We can't understand his reluctance to be interviewed on the record or why he wasn't compelled uh, yesterday to, for testimony on the record. Um, where you've been very accommodating to this witness. Our staffs made it clear to your staff we wanted to examine him on the record. And uh, his views on the situation, in my judgment, is colored by his apparent personal investment in various technology decisions that he made, and many of these were ultimately rejected. Uh, with res uh, without the op opportunity to test Mr. McDevitt's views on the record, we remain skeptical of the content of his interrogatory responses, and we think the committee should uh, uh, as, as well. The preservation of essential records, though, is a government-wide responsibility and a growing challenge with so much more of the public's business done today using electronic media rather than paper. The massive proliferation of digital records confronts each branch of government with complex and potentially costly questions about which records to keep, how long to keep them, and how best to store and index them for retrieval. But it appears today's hearing may be less about preserving records and more about resurrecting this claim that the White House lost millions of official emails. It is a charge that is based on a discredited internal report conveniently leaked to the media. Information gathered since then has forced administration critics to back away from the politically charged allegation and acknowledge the less sensational but far more probative technical realities that are at work here. Regarding the capabilities of the White House's information technology infrastructure, the facts are not all in yet, and in that respect, this hearings could be viewed as premature, but we do know this much. During the White House migration from Lotus Notes to a Microsoft email system in 2002, some archive files may have been mislabeled, making them difficult to find using routine search protocols. A preliminary study in 2005 using these old protocols seemed to show 473 days of which no emails were sent at all. The White House has been very open with our staff about the technical flaws in that early search, and they have devoted substantial technological resources to solving the email glitch. One of our witnesses today, White House Chief Information Officer Teresa Payton, is leading that effort. Last Friday, she briefed the committee staff that the 473-day gap has been reduced to 202. So a substantial portion of the missing emails appear not to be missing at all, just filed in the wrong digital drawer. The restoration recovery process continues and should continue. But the Committee's voracious appetite for White House emails raises another issue worth discussing today, the boundaries between legitimate oversight and counterproductive intrusion into the operations of a co-equal branch of government. Any frustration at the White House's inability to instantaneously produce every conceivable stream of electrons has to be tempered by both the legal rights and prerogatives of the executive and by the technical realities of modern government record keeping. The Presidential Records Act does not require the White House to keep every paper or electronic document generated in the course of daily business. 
the law requires presidential records to constitute adequate documentation of official deliberations and decisions. I expect we will hear today that the White House is well aware of its obligations under the Presidential Records Act and other laws and cognizant of the duty to preserve and provide adequate presidential records to the National Archives. And in terms of the scope of the oversight, we should keep in mind the power of inquiry when used injudiciously can become the power to distract or to disrupt those trying to execute the laws that we write. Remember where all this started, an investigation of the GSA Administrator. From there, we moved to a far broader inquiry into the Hatch Act compliance at Cabinet departments and a subpoena to the Republican National Committee for emails from the White House. From that inquiry, we came to this hearing to discuss emails about emails. At some point, this risked becoming investigation for its own sake or for the sake of private plaintiffs looking to use the committee to conduct nonjudicial discovery in pending lawsuits against the government. Nor is it the best use of our time and resources to attempt to micromanage executive branch activities like the next White House transition based on groundless suspicions or incomplete investigations into missing emails. Nevertheless, our witnesses can help us understand the intricacies and challenges of electronic records preservation. We welcome their testimony this morning. And I want to repeat, I think, as the, uh, institutionally the legislative branch uh, does have the right to, to pursue these and to get, uh, get these emails. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Davis. Before we uh, recognize our witnesses, we are going to have a private discussion and set a time for a debate and a vote on adding the uh, interrogatories to the record. But I just want to give a clarification of, the, of what had transpired. On January 30, the committee wrote to Mr. McDevitt asking him to come in for an interview. He was responsive and immediately scheduled an interview for Monday, February 11th. The White House then contacted Mr. McDevitt and instructed him not to discuss with the committee broad areas relevant to our investigation, including, quote, any deliberative discussions involving the participation of OCO, OCIO management, end quote. So Mr. McDevitt emailed us and he said, based on the direction of the White House, quote, there's practically nothing that I'm authorized to discuss with the committee, end quote. As a result, uh, given these limitations placed on us by the White House counsel, uh, he said he would have to decline our, his requ our request for an interview. So both sides requested this interview. Over the next week, minority and majority staff discussed the committee's interest in obtaining information, Mr. McDevitt, and on February 14th, our staffs jointly agreed to send Mr. McDevitt questions in writing, allowing him to share his responses with the White House counsel. So together, our staff sent him questions. He responded in writing to those questions. The White House had a re chance to review his answers, and they uh, cleared them without any redactions. Now, after we got the answers from Mr. McDevitt, there was responses this past weekend that the minority staff indicated they wanted to speak with Mr. McDevitt in person. Nevertheless, even at this late date, our staff went to uh, uh, great lengths to accommodate the minority after they read his written reports, they didn't, want, they, didn't, they didn't feel comfortable with it. So on Sunday night, minority and majority staff jointly called Mr. McDevitt to see if he would be willing to come in for an interview or deposition. He stated he still had the same concerns about the White House instructions. However, he went on to answer questions from the minority, the Republicans, for an hour and a half answering every single question they had. Despite this second opportunity to question Mr. McDevitt, the minority now says it's somehow unfair to use any information provided by Mr. McDevitt because they didn't get an opportunity to question him. Well, they had an opportunity two weeks ago. They got another opportunity on Sunday night, which they fully exhausted. It seems to, to me if the minority has a beef with anyone, it should be the White House Counsel's Office, since they're the ones who told Mr. McDevitt he wasn't allowed to speak with us in the first place. Thank I, you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just quick. We can. We'll, yes. we'll talk about this, and, and uh, we'll, we'll find an accommodation. But let me just say that there were six other witnesses that were subject to the same White House ground rules, and they were brought in for on-the-record interviews and cross-examination. Mr. McDevitt was the only one that was accommodated, uh, and we but we believe because he fit the story that you wanted to tell. And we think that there is another side that we would like that opportunity. I don't care what the White House Counsel's Office says on this. We are speaking to this as a review committee. But we can have this discussion down the road and uh, try to reach an appropriate accommodation. And hopefully we can move ahead with our witnesses. Well, I might point out that the other witnesses agreed to come in. 
Mr. McDevitt refused to come in for an interview. And he did that because the White House told him there was nothing he could say to us in an interview. So we proceeded in the way that seemed fit. Uh, I know that now that the minority has looked at what he has to say, they'd like to see if they can impeach him well, because they don't like what he had to say. Well, there are inconsistencies with what he said because he's been well, gone for 18 months. Let's, uh, let's get the witnesses here today on record and we can ask them questions about what Mr. McDevitt had to say and go probe into this whole thing further. But the reality is that there are a lot of emails, which is the primary way people send uh, communications to each other from high officials in the White House that cannot be located. And that, as I understand it, is not just what we're saying, what Mr. McDevitt has said, but uh, the archives as well. And from the archives, uh, we're pleased to have Dr. Alan Weinstein. He's the ninth archi archivist of the United States and leads the National Archives and Records Administration. We also have Gary M. Stern, the general counsel for the National Archives and Records Administration. Sharon Fawcett is the assistant archivist for presidential libraries at the National Archives and Records Administration. Alan R. Swendeman is the Director of White House Office of Administration. And Teresa Payton is the Chief Information Officer at the White House Office of Administration. We're pleased to welcome all okay, of Mr. you. Mr. Chairman, can I just make one? We, we yes. join with you in wanting to get all the emails and not giving up on getting. I just want to make that clear. This is not an effort to stop uh, the disclosure of these. We want to get at these. We really object to the characterization of how this came out. We think much of this is technical. And hopefully, this hearing will be able to bring both sides an opportunity to bring that up. Thank you. Well, I hope so, because I think on a bipartisan basis, we want to find out where those emails right. are and get them. Uh, I don't know what characterization you object to, because I've been very careful not to make any characterization, unlike the situation we had in this committee in the 1990s. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's the policy of this committee that all witnesses that testify before us testify under oath, so I'd like to ask if you would to please rise and raise your right hand. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record uh, will indicate that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, Dr. Weinstein, why don't we start with you? Uh, all of you have sent uh, prepared statements, or those of you who have sent prepared statements, I want to assure you that they'll be in the record in full. We'd like to ask, if you would, to try to limit the oral presentation to five minutes. We'll have a clock uh, that will be on the, uh, indicated on the table, green, then the last, uh, after four minutes, there'll be a yellow, and then after five minutes is complete, uh, it'll turn red. At, if you're not finished by that point, we'd like to ask you to uh, summarize uh, the last part of your testimony. Can I Dr. ask you before I start, Mr. Chairman? Yes. I'll be making the only opening statement for the archives. And I gather my two colleagues from the White House both, oh. both make a statement. Does that mean I get 10 minutes? Well, then, then that, go ahead okay. and take whatever time Thank you need. You. And uh, under those circumstances, it seems Good. reasonable. Good morning, Chairman Waxman, <clears throat> Ranking Member Davis, and members of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. Thank you for calling this hearing and for your continued attention to the management, protection, and preservation of government information. The National Archives General Counsel Gary Stern, Assistant Archivist for Presidential Library Sharon Fawcett, accompany me this morning and will be available to assist me in responding to questions from the committee. I'm pleased to appear before you today to discuss the work of the National Archives and Records Administration, NARA, in managing presidential papers at the time of transition from one president's administration to the next. I will summarize my remarks and ask that my full statement be included in the record. Let me begin by discussing preparation for the transition in January 2009 of the presidential records of the George W. Bush administration to the National Archives. The National Archives has a long and successful history of moving presidential records and gifts from the White House to the custody of the archives for ultimate deposit in the presidential library. We've done this work under the exigent circumstances of current departure as in the case of Presidents Kennedy and Nixon, the foreshortened notice of one-term administration, such as George H.W. Bush, and the more predictable pace afforded by a two-term president, for example, William Jefferson Clinton. The National Archives begins preparing for an eventual move from the first day of an administration. However, as you might imagine, Mr. Chairman, most of the actual work takes place in the last year of a president's term. We work closely with the White House Counsel's Office, the White House Office of Records Management, 
the National Security Council, the White House Photo Office, the Office of Administration, and other appropriate White House offices in accounting for all presidential records, textual, electronic, and audiovisual, and in arranging for their physical transfer to the National Archives. We also work with the White House Gift Unit in inventorying and packing the thousands of foreign and domestic gifts that will be included in the holdings of the Presidential Library and Museum. Traditionally, the Department of Defense also supports the National Archives in packing and transporting the records from Washington to the library site. Beginning in the summer of 2007, National Archives staff attended several preliminary meetings with White House staff to discuss the transition process. In late fall, Archives staff began to meet with IT staff from the Office of Administration to discuss the transfer of electronic records. Archives staff has also met with the staff of the National Security Council regarding its classified electronic records which are maintained separately from the systems managed by the Office of Administration. We expect that transition meetings will continue on a regular basis and look forward to working with White House staff in ensuring a smooth move of a massive amount of records. The National Archives has leased a temporary facility in the Dallas, Texas area that will serve as the archival repository for these records until the George W. Bush Presidential Library is completed. We have already begun to hire and train archival staff along with a museum register who will take charge of the records and gifts as they arrive. We expect to continue the hiring of a full staff when we receive our FY 2009 appropriation. Now I'd like to turn to your question on the National Archives actions concerning the possibility of missing White House emails. The Presidential Records Act, PRA, does not give the archivist uh, the authority, formal or oversight authority, uh, regarding how an incumbent president performs his records management responsibilities, but rather vests records management authority entirely and exclusively with the incumbent president. Nevertheless, throughout the course of an administration, when we are invited to do so, both I and my staff try to provide our best guidance and advice on matters affecting White House records management. When we read the press reports in April 2007 that the White House had apparently acknowledged that a large number of emails might be missing from the Executive Office of the President, the EOP system, we immediately began to inquire about this matter with White House staff. The National Archives made similar inquiries in 2006 upon learning of press reports that Special Counsel Patrick Fitzgerald had reported on email archiving problems with the Office of the Vice President's records. Sometime later in April 2007, White House staff told us that a chart prepared in 2005 indicated that there might be some missing emails, but that no one within the Executive Office of the President, EOP, had been able to validate the chart's, the chart's results. My staff was further informed that efforts would be made to corroborate whether any emails were actually missing. In addition, because the EOP mail system contains records governed under both the Presidential Records Act and the Federal Records Act, FRA, on May 6, 2007, I sent a standard letter to the director of the White House Office of Administration requesting a report on the allegations of unauthorized destruction of, a, of federal records. This letter has been provided to the committee. To this day, uh, I, uh, I have not received a written reply to the May 6, 2007 letter. We have been diligent in requesting periodic updates on the status of the White House's review of these allegations and the possibility of missing federal and presidential emails. The White House has responded regularly, if inconclusively, that its review is still continuing. Further, we have made our views clear, both to the White House and to this committee, that in the event emails are determined to be missing, it is the responsibility of the White House to locate and restore all the emails, probably from the backup tapes, and that such a project needs to begin as soon as possible. The National Archives has also emphasized that supplemental congressional funding to the White House will almost certainly be necessary for such a restoration effort. A similar situation occurred, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, near the end of the Clinton administration with its automated records management system, ARMS, A-R-M-S. And the Office of Administration, the White House, took full responsibility at that time in restoring an estimated 2 million emails. Because of the problems that occurred with the ARMS system during the Clinton administration, the National Archives recommended to the incoming George W. Bush administration that it replace ARMS with a new electronic records management application for its emails as soon as possible. 
The Bush 43 White House expressed interest and invited the National Archives to work with the Office of Administration in developing the requirements for a new system. The National Archives staff worked with the Office of Administration from late 2001 until the summer of 2004 on what came to be known as the Proposed Electronic Communications Records Management System, or ECRMS. The National Archives staff reviewed de deliverables and documentation produced as part of this system design effort, with our primary concern being to facilitate the transfer of these electronic records at the end of the administration. In the fall of 2006, the National Archives learned that the Office of Administration had decided not to implement ECRMS. In early 2007, the National Archives began meetings with the Office of Administration to discuss how the Office proposed to manage Executive Office of the President emails in anticipation of the up upcoming transition. The National Archives was not informed about the possibility of missing emails at this time. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my testimony. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions that may remain. Thank you very much, Mr. Weinstein. I assume Mr. Stern and Ms. Fawcett are here to answer questions that we may have. Uh, Ms. Payton, let's hear from you next. Or do, would you prefer Mr. Swindeman to go next? Yes. There's a button on the base of the mic. Be sure it's pushed in and close enough to you to pick it all up. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. I am Alan Swendeman, and I currently serve as Special Assistant to the President and Director of the Office of Administration. Thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in this hearing. Accompanying me is Teresa Payton, who is the Chief Information Officer for the Office of Administration. I am pleased to appear before you today on the subjects of email records keeping practices at the Executive Office of the President during this administration and the status of presidential transition planning in relation to records of this administration. I will summarize these remarks and ask that my full statement be included in the record. I have served as Director of the Office of Administration since November 27, 2006. OA's mission is to provide common administrative and support services to the EOP. The Office of the Chief Information Office is one of the operating units of OA, and among its important functions, OCIO is responsible for providing all EOP components with unified enterprise services. Certain of the subjects that the committee may ask today uh, are within the purview of the OCIO, and Ms. Payton may speak to them. I'll direct my remarks principally to OA's efforts on the important subject of presidential transition planning. Presidential records are the property of the United States government, and OA takes very seriously its responsibilities for the transfer of records to the National Archives. These responsibilities derive in significant measure from the Presidential Records Act, and the effective fulfillment of these responsibilities is important to the continuity of the presidency as an institution and for the Bush presidency. And we are focused on making this transition process as smooth and cooperative as possible. Toward that end, trans transition-related meetings between NARA and White House began in approximately the summer of 2007. At that time, NARA noted and welcomed what it described as EOP's early engagement on transition and presidential records issues. Since that first meeting, there have been at least eight meetings with NARA and there are numerous internal meetings. For example, NARA has met with the OA offices of the Chief Financial Officer, uh, the Chief Facilities Management Officer, and the Chief Operating Officer to receive records-related functional and operational briefings and to ask questions. NARA and OA are committed to continuing to meet, and in fact, the next meeting is this Friday, February 29th. Through these meetings, NARA will learn about the dozens and dozens of computer applications that, at the EOP that may have records subject to PRA, which will be need to be transferred uh, to NARA. Now, the upcoming presidential transition is going to be a complex one involving new technologies and new people. These complexities are heightened by the existing cyber threats of which this committee is undoubtedly aware. These cybersecurity considerations impact, among other things, the way we are able to safely transfer records to NARA. Now, this will be the first transition in which OA as an entity has been subject to the PRA, and OA is fully engaged in that process. We've already seen issues arise as to whether certain materials are records or non-records under the PRA. 
One particular challenge facing the institution is the necessity of identifying and making available in some form records that will be needed for the 44th president and his or her staff. Financial records, procurement records, leases, blueprints and other property records, security records and personnel records are just a few of those kinds of records. From this summary, we trust that the committee can see that a lot of predicate work has begun and is ongoing. We have approximately 11 months remaining to work on this transition, and we are committed to making sure that all the presidential records that we have transferred to NARA are transferred at the end of this administration. As a final matter, I understand that the committee has inquired about whether EOP emails may not have been properly preserved between 2003 and 2005, and the potential implications on transition should it be determined that such emails are missing. The potential discovery of this issue and the immediate response to it, of course, predated my service as OA director. The OA staff, and including Ms. Payton, can discuss this issue in more detail. But what I can say is this. I am proud of the work that they have been doing and continue to do under the leadership of Ms. Payton in order to determine whether any such emails are missing. It is a complex process, one that takes time to do right, and one that we have not taken lightly. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. Thank you for your attention, members of the committee, and I would be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mrs. Swindem. Ms. Payton, are you, do you have a statement as well? Yes. Uh, There's a button on the base of your mic. Please be sure to push it in. I, have a Can you hear me? <laughs> I think I direct Is you to better? turn it off. Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, good morning, Chairman Waxman, uh, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the committee. Um, Alan did touch a little bit on the OCI role, so I would like to talk to you a little bit about some of the services we offer. Um, I'm Teresa Payton, and I'm the Chief Information Officer in the Office of Administration, Executive Office of the President. I've been in this role since mid-May of 2006, and it's been an honor and a pleasure to serve. Some of the services that we provide to the EOP, as Alan mentioned, are to the 12 components that comprise the Executive Office of the President. There's over 3,000 customers in those 12 components, and some of the services that we provide to them include but aren't limited to office automation, intranet support, 24 by 7 production support should they need it, desktop support, we do continuity of operations support, disaster recovery backup information, and we're also responsible for the email messaging system for the sensitive but unclassified part of the EOP network, and we're also responsible for the records keeping of all of those emails and making sure we have a successful transition to NARA at the end of the presidential transition. Um, I did provide a detailed written testimony that um, I understand um, from you, Chairman Waxman, will be in the record. So I just want to give a few summary comments uh, before I turn it over for questions. I wanted to focus uh, the work primarily that we've been doing from late 2006 up until today and um, give you a little bit of explanation about um, the leadership determination of the people that I work for, as well as the people that work for me in the office of uh, the Chief Information Officer. Um, we've undertaken three tracks since late 2006 until today. The first track involves people and process. The second track involves improving the current technology we have in place. And then the third track is what we're calling the longer view. So this is about getting a more comprehensive technology platform in place for archiving, records keeping, um, as well as legal searches. Under people and process, I'll just give you a couple examples of some of the things we've been able to accomplish. Um, first of all, uh, we recognized um, we, have a, we have a slim staff. We're you know, a small but mighty team supporting the 3,000 customers. We have roughly 55 federal employees and roughly 60 contractors to support those 3,000 customers. We took a look at um, the resource allocation and the manpower stacked up against records keeping versus the other parts of the um, operation and the, and the mission that we serve. And in 2006, we had roughly uh, the equivalent of 10 of our 115 uh, employees were, from a manpower perspective, dedicated to records keeping. We've ramped that up. Uh, we looked at our mission. We have uh, slimmed down some of the services we provide in some other parts of the mission, and we've ramped that up in 2007. We had the equivalent uh, manpower of about 22 people out of the 115 focused on records keeping. 
and we've ramped that up a little bit more for 2008 and we're currently running at about 23.5. So that's an example of some of the people um, investments. From a process improvement standpoint, um, we've put in uh, place some improved processes while we're on the current technology we're on um, and to make sure that on a go forward basis, uh, we are accounting for um, all of the information. So one example of an improvement that we've put in place last year is our weekly report. So the messaging team does daily work if they have any technology glitches, they note those in a log. Then there is a second team who does a QA of the work they're doing to make sure that the messages that went into the Microsoft Journal that were then automatically moved through a software program that we have into Microsoft Personal Storage Tables, or PSTs. A second group takes a look at that work, and also, if they note any technology glitches, notes that in the log. On a weekly basis, an executive summary report is produced for myself and for our Office of Administration General Counsel. And this provides transparency that wasn't available before on a weekly basis about any technology glitches that may have occurred, the mediating steps that needed to be taken or still need to be taken, and then a weekly report as, as to where um, they are in their progress. Um, this has provided a couple different tools for us to use, the first being the transparency and knowing if there is a glitch that people need to be focused on fixing that. The second is it actually gives us historical information. So from a go forward perspective, if somebody's looking back and trying to look for email records on certain dates, they actually have a place they can go look, um, a comprehensive place that tells them what occurred, what components, and what was done to mitigate that risk. Um, the other is a learning tool for the team. So we're in the process of rolling out um, what's um, known uh, and, and the government's adopting it, Six Sigma, where you look for opportunities to reduce de defects. And by doing this weekly report, we're collecting statistics so they can look backwards on trends and look for opportunities to reduce future defects. So that's an example of a process improvement. Um, one of the areas you're probably going to be the most um, interested in, though, is going to be the technology improvements we've made on our existing technology. So as I mentioned before, um, and I can go into more detail during the questions, we have email that goes um, into the journal, the Microsoft Journal. It's automatically moved through a program that we um, have in place since 2005 into the PST archive for records keeping. And um, what we've been doing is actually re-baselining that entire inventory of the records. Um, we felt like it we had to do this. Um, we found some different technology glitches in some of um, some tools that have been wonderful workhorses um, for EOP. Um, but as we were trying to do the analysis to, to try and figure out what was going on with the problem days and we were having problems replicating some and some were replicating, um, we felt it in the best interest to upgrade and update some of those tools and implement those tools around the records keeping, inventory, and statistical analysis process. We're in the early phase. We actually have three phases we're implementing for this. We're in the early phase of that process where um, we've just started to get some early results. They have not had a quality assurance check on them, so the results are very preliminary and they're not conclusive. Um, some of the promising trends that we've been seeing is we have identified more emails um, for that exact time period um, that was looked at in 2005 than was previously identified. Um, we have been able to identify um, and uh, locate emails within exchange for days that were previously read. There are in this phase one some days that still show as read. Um, that's where phase two is going to come in. From a phase two perspective, um, we will be looking at the message level, and I can get into more detail on that um, during the Q&A. Um, but in phase two, um, it, it is our desire and our hope to eliminate all or most of the red days and low volume days by being able to read the information down at a more granular level. When we get through a QA process in phase one and phase two, we will be sitting down with NARA to talk through our findings, um, where we still have anomalies, if we have any, and when we finish phase two, we'll sit down with NARA, and if there are any anomalies remaining, that's where we'll have the conversation around a records restore, um, most likely looking at our disaster recovery backup tapes. Um, the OCIO staff is incredibly dedicated. Um, they are working very hard on this effort. Everyone on the team wants a successful NARA transition. We want to make sure we get all of the email records over to NARA 
a transition. Thank you, and I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> By agreement, uh, uh, bipartisan agreement on the committee, uh, the, the uh, chairman will take, uh, control 15 minutes of questioning, and then uh, Mr. Davis will control 15 minutes on his side. So I will uh, start off the questions. Mr. Uh, Weinstein, I want to ask you some questions first. Uh, this hearing is about the uh, White House compliance with an important open government law, the Presidential Records <laughs> Act. This act requires the President to ensure that his activities, deliberations, decisions, and policies are adequately documented. The act makes clear that a president's records belong to the American people, not to the president or his advisors or the Republican Party. Uh, as the archivist, uh, how important do you think the Presidential Rec Records Act is? It's, a, it's incredibly important, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I think uh, all of us agree that whatever our politics are, we're all, we're all in agreement on that point. Uh, it's important. So. It's important yes. because this preserves the records not only for history, but uh, the records as, as for the next administration. To the American people. And that, that best preserves it. Yes. Thank you. Now, over the last year, serious questions have been raised about the White House compliance with this Presidential Records Act. We've mm -hmm. learned about two violations of the act that appear to be serious. One involves the extensive use of Republican National Committee email accounts by White House staff, and the other involves the failure to archive emails sent through the official White House email system. I want to start out by asking you about the use of these RNC email accounts to conduct official White House business. This committee first started asking questions about the use of RNC emails last March. As we investigated, we learned three facts. One, many senior White House officials, including Carl Rove and Andrew Card, had RNC email accounts. Two, these officials made heavy use of these accounts, including for official purposes, such as communicating, uh, as, including for official purposes, such as communicating about federal appointments and policies. And three, the RNC preserved almost none of these emails from President Bush's first term and only some of the emails from his second term. Dr. Weinstein, the documents that we have seen reveal that the archives was concerned about these RNC missing emails as well. Can you explain why? Well, I wish I had all the facts at this stage in the game, Chairman, to do. Could to you speak up, pull the maybe? I wish I had all the facts at this point to discuss this issue, but the fact is that it's been our understanding that the RNC was, that the White House has been working with the RNC to try to restore PRA emails that were created. Well, perhaps RNC they documents. are or they're not when we get into that, but is, how important uh, and how concerned are you that uh, we may not have the RNC emails from senior White well, House? Chairman, I'm, con I'm concerned about the problems that we might have with any group of records, including these. I, I want the fullest, I think the American people want the fullest possible account of any administration. Carl, Carl Rowe was a key advisor to the President. We also know he was an extensive user of the RNC account. Mr. Rove is reported to have sent and received, quote, about 95 percent, end quote, of his emails through his RNC account. His secretary, Susan Ralston, confirmed for the committee that Mr. Rove used his RNC account extensively. When we asked the RNC what kinds of records they had, they told us they had virtually no emails from Mr. Rove before November 2003. They had virtually none of his emails for 2001, 2002, and most of 2003. Well, these years were in many ways the defining mm. years for the Bush administration. They include the critical months when President Bush was making the case for war in Iraq. Are you concerned about the loss of Mr. Rove's emails for these years, Mr. Weinstein? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'm concerned about the loss of emails, that, or White House emails, no matter what the system they're involved in. I'm concerned about maintaining the fullest possible presidential records. I should, add all, I should add perhaps that in listening to Ms. Payton's testimony, we are still awaiting the, the completion at the White House of this process. Of, of well, we, are, we are too, but I want to ask you about these RNC emails first before, before we get into further, that. Before going any further, though, my counsel has dealt with this issue to a very great extent. I'm going to ask Gary Stern if he'd like to add okay. anything. Mr. Stern. 
Yeah, as, and as we've discussed with the committee staff and with the White House, uh, our view is presidential records uh, exist and must be preserved whatever system they're used on. So to the extent they were used on a non-White House system, it's still the responsibility of the White House to preserve them. Uh, we understand that, that also White House officials uh, create non-presidential records, and then for those records, it would be appropriate to use a non-White House system like the RNC system for, for non-presidential records involving uh, political campaign and all. But we know Mr. Rove used most of the most of his emails, whatever the subject, on RNC accounts. And so if we have deletion of Mr. Rove's RNC email as the rule for the White House, not the exception, uh, we, we, uh, we don't know what he had, and, uh, had to say. In fact, the committee learned that the RNC retained no email messages for all of 51 of the 88 White House officials with RNC email accounts. We don't know whether they're personal, political, or official government. The records appear to be woefully incomplete for the remaining 37 officials. For example, the RNC retained emails from before 2006 for only 14. So we had 51 of the 88 White House officials using email accounts, and the records are incomplete except for 14 of these officials. Uh, Mr. Stern or Dr. Weinstein, you and others at the National Archives have made repeated inquiries to the White House about this problem, and the White House appeared to tell you it was taking all this very seriously. And I want to read some notes from a May 21, 2007 meeting. Y your uh, staff asked what steps the White House was taking to restore these emails. And here's what your staff said they were told, and I want to quote. We then asked about the RNC email issue. They, the White House, are working with the RNC and looking at this issue. They are exploring how they will try to capture the presidential uh, record emails. This will be a separate restoration effort from the EOP email restoration, end quote. Uh, Dr. Weinstein, can you tell us what the current status is of the recovery effort? Specifically, has the White House taken steps to restore <clears throat> RNC backup tapes? Well, I hate to say this, Mr. Chairman, but I'm afraid that's a question that's going to have to be asked to Ms. Payton and Mr. Swindeman, simply because we have not been given that information. We well, were told that by her testimony that the process is nearly complete, which is a phrase that she You used. have been told by the White House that the process it's is in, nearly in, complete to get the RNC emails? That's, that's the other. Mr. Stern, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, on the RNC system, we have inquired uh, periodically, and we were under the impression they were still working with the RNC, and so, some effort would be undertaken to recover whatever could be recovered from either backup tapes or from laptops, individual hard drives. Um, we heard today that maybe a DRNC is not doing that, and that would be uh, a concern and, and, and a problem and disappointment. If it's a funding issue, that's where Congress would uh, potentially need to come in and say, if there are government records there, they... So you uh, were relying on the White House telling you that they're, they're, going, they're going to make sure they get the, all the records, including from the RNC. That's correct, which is their responsibility. Yes, yes. and I can understand why you would um, think that they should be the one doing it. But we talked to to um, the RNC yesterday, and they told us that the White House has taken no steps to obtain backup tapes. The White House hasn't begun any type of restoration effort, and the tapes haven't been touched. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're concerned about that. Is that correct? Well, more than concerned about that, <coughs> Chairman. <coughs> Obviously, if that, that's the case, <coughs> this should be looked into as soon as it's Well, Ms. Over. Payton and Mr. Swindeman, I'd like to get your perspective the White House told the archives last May that it was exploring a restoration of RNC email, but what, when we checked, the RNC told us the White House never even obtained the RNC's backup tapes. Why isn't the White House following through to recover and preserve these records? Chairman Waxman, since you mentioned me first, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, I have responsibility for the Executive Office of the President network and email, so uh, I'm I'm unfortunately unqualified to talk to you about the RNC Restore. I'm not part of that process. Um, if at some point there were... Uh, you're, you're not part of the process no, to get sir, the RNC not, emails? No, sir, okay, I'm not. Okay, well, maybe Mr. Swindham is part of that process. I'm, as part of the Office of Administration, Mr. Chairman, we have responsibility for the uh, official but sensitive EOP network. Uh, we can't uh, control what individuals do uh, on their own. But you have the responsibility for all the <coughs> officials working at the White House to get their email records. And if they use some other email system, 
Aren't you responsible to gather that information for, under the Presidential Records Act? Well, I'm advised, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, that uh, uh, Council's office uh, has taken steps uh, with regard uh, to that. Uh, that letters have gone out to former White House employees uh, with regards to use <coughs> of uh, RNC uh, laptops. That uh, there is letters telling them not to do it in the future or to get the information from the past. I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't know the exact substance of the letter. I simply um, have been advised that uh, that step has been taken. Uh, will you, uh, taken. Will you uh, uh, get that information? What what steps have been taken? What letters have been sent? I'll consult with counsel. Yes, sir. Well, I'm sure we asked the counsel for this information. <laughs> uh, the White House emails that the RNC deleted are the core types of communications that the Presidential Records Act is supposed to preserve. They're the candid communications of the President's most senior advisors. The White House may not want these emails disclosed. The White House may be worried that the true record of how the White House led the nation to war in Iraq will be embarrassing. But that's not a legitimate reason for your failure to recover the deleted emails. Uh, I think it's tremendously important that we get those Republican National Committee emails. And I assume, Mr. Weinstein, that uh, <coughs> you agree the RNC has a box of backup tapes. Are, are they being searched, Mr. Swendeman? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, what is being searched? A uh, box of backup tapes at the RNC. I, I don't <coughs> know. I, all I can tell you, Mr. Chairman, is, is that uh, among the steps that I'm advised are being taken is, uh, first of all, mention the letter. Yeah, just pull the microphone and be sure it's on. It, 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 our members are having trouble hearing you. Uh, the second is, is that uh, there have been uh, contractual uh, efforts with regards to forensic and recovery. Uh, I cannot at this time tell you the uh, status. Well, this is what this hearing is all about, and that's why you were invited to come. We were told that the White House has not even asked for them. Uh, is that a problem if the White House hasn't even asked for them? They assured you, Mr. <coughs> uh, Dr. Weinstein and Mr. Stern, that they're going to take care of it and they're going to get this information. Mr. Chairman, I can only promise you one thing, that you and Ranking Member Davis and the members of this, com of this committee will have my best information on this by the end of the week. I'm going to make some inquiries as soon as this hearing is over and hope that we can get to the, to the heart of the matter. Well, so we, uh, I don't have an answer for you now. You don't have the answers, because no. the White House assured you they were getting it, and it looks like, from what we hear, they haven't done anything. Well, I, I, uh, Dr. Weinstein, you wrote to Fred Fielding, the White House counsel, about this issue on May 1, 2007. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, particularly the archiving in the White House system itself. You wrote, we believe that it's essential that the White House move with the <coughs> utmost dispatch, both in assessing any problems that may exist with preserving emails on the executive office of the President's system and in taking whatever action may be necessary to restore any missing emails. After you wrote this letter, your staff made several attempts to learn more, but these weren't successful. And I want to read from a memo that Mr. Stern wrote to you on September 5, 2007. Now we're talking about the official White House email system. And Mr. Stern wrote, we, will, we still have made almost zero progress in actually moving ahead with the important and necessary work that is required for a successful transition. More significantly, our repeated requests to begin office by office meetings to scope out and inventory the volume formats and sensitivities of the PRA records that will be transferred to the Nas National Archives has gone unheeded. Of most importance, we still know virtually nothing about the status of the alleged missing White House emails. We have not received a written response to our May 5, 2007 letter, uh, we, a letter regarding alleged missing federal record emails. As we stressed to the White House last spring, it is vital that any needed backup restoration project begin as soon as possible in order that it be completed before the end of the administration. Dr. Weinstein, what was your reaction when Mr. Stern informed you that the White House had still provided virtually no information about a potentially large loss of presidential records? And how would you describe the situation now? Do you have it, all the information you need to assess the extent of this problem? In response to your first question, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm obviously not happy <clears throat> about that situation. I'd like an answer, and I'd, I'd like to move forward on this process. 
in connection with uh, what the situation is today, I think we have a, a very sensitized group of people to this issue, but we, ha we, we, ha we don't have the results yet. But that's why I ask you for a few more days to see whether I can get some results for you. Well, we'll certainly, without objection, hold the record open for you Free to give us any further information, and I'm sure you'll get further days. questions about this. But Congress doesn't have all the information we need. We still don't know what the White House is going to recover, uh, uh, whether they're going to recover the missing White House emails that the RNC deleted. And every week we seem to get a different story from the White House about whether the White House's own email archives are complete. I think it's important we get those RNC emails and we get the White House emails and from their own operating system. And without that, this administration is not complying with the Presidential Records Act. I want to uh, recognize Mr. Davis for uh, Thank you. Let minutes. me just say that these people are not responsible for the RNC emails. That says they, they have a separate corporate culture over there. Isn't that correct in terms of that is when correct. they move them? And you're not into that loop uh, particularly. The, the other thing that, that, uh, that troubles me about this is the fact that when you have the committee asking the RNC to recover emails that they may or may not have, is that's at a huge expense to the National Committee. Uh, I, my feeling, and, and we need to look at this in the future when you have Congresses of different parties going after <coughs> political committees, that is taking a lot of money uh, out of the system to, uh, for congressional investigations that could go other places. And I think if, you know, if Congress really wants to pursue this, we ought to look at an appropriation or something and not have it come out of their coffers. It's been hundreds of thousands at a minimum that I know that it's cost the RNC uh, in this particular case. Let me make a, uh, ask some questions. Um, Ms. Payton, we have backup tapes for all of this, don't we? Uh, for, excuse all me, All the sir, emails. Are there backup tapes? We have uh, disaster recovery backup tapes. Um, well, what's the difference between a disaster recovery backup tape and a backup tape? Do um, sure. Uh, um, let me try and explain it. Um, so from a disaster recovery standpoint, which is what our backup tapes are, what you do is you actually take a picture of what um, all of the servers, the applications. Well, the backup tape covers everything that happened. Yes, It sir. may be for disaster recovery, but are there backups for all of these missing emails? Um, we, we believe we should have backups based on our um, first pass analysis, which is not complete and has not been QA'd yet. Um, we but in all likelihood, there are backups for everything. Yes, sir. So there's nothing really missing here. It's recoverable. We won't know until we finish the analysis, but um, we, we feel very confident that we'll be able to use the disaster recovery backup tapes if we need to. Um, at the end of phase two of our analysis, if we still so have So the committee anomalies. should be able to get this if they, if they want it one way or the other? Is that yes, sir. Okay. That, I mean, I think that's important to get out here. Now, it is expensive going through the disaster recovery backup tapes to retrieve that, is it not? Yes. Can you describe the cost to me? Um, the, the team actually put together an algorithm uh, based on having to do this uh, before. And basically, the, the algorithm, and it's ver a very rough approximation, but if you have uh, one component, one day, that needs to be restored from a disaster recovery backup tape, we've estimated it would cost around $50,000 for one component one day. So if you have three components on one single day, that would be three times 50,000, which would be 150,000. Well, can you give me a ballpark number if we had to go to the backup? Let's assume for a minute we can't recover the originals of this. If to get what the committee wanted to, uh, if we had to go to backup, can you give me a ballpark? Yeah, there's also um, uh, servers that would have to be purchased because you wouldn't want to do the, you wouldn't want to do the backup on servers you already have. So we said it'd be about, $500,000 for the servers, and if we, um, I believe, and I'm, I'm working off of memory here, um, but I believe we had said if we uh, restored every single day from the original analysis, it was going to be somewhere in the ballpark of like 15 million or, or more. Okay. But it is recoverable. I mean, I think you, in, in your judgment, by the time you've looked at all of this, one way or the other, these haven't been doctored or hidden. That it is recoverable. Yes, it should be at recoverable. Any cost. The, the caveat I give is, I mean, you, you don't know what you don't know until you get into the technology. And so sometimes you don't know if there might be a flaw in a tape and some of those other things. But based on what we know right now, it should be recoverable. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Rice, you want to? Thank you. Uh, thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Chairman, I would, I would ask, uh, since I understand we're going to accept additional information at the end of this hearing, that uh, the back and forth correspondence with uh, Mr. Stephen uh, McDivitt uh, 
related to the White House guidance and his further guidance be included in the record. Without objection, that will be the order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to yield for one more uh, of second time. Uh, let me just make one other comment on White House versus RNC, because this is a long-term problem I think this committee needs to wrestle with if we're going to be uh, successful. Um, wh when you have, you have a political operation in the White House, and it's, you do politics and you do governance at the same time, to be able to use government systems to do political emails would really not be consistent would it, with the Hatch Act and everything else. Does everybody's understanding? Mr. Stern. Well, that's correct. And with the Presidential Records Act, the Presidential Records Act itself uh, requires that White House officials separate presidential records from what are called personal records, which include political records. So it, it's, they are supposed to keep them separate and generally not use government systems for non-governmental yeah. business. I think what we need to do, I, we can't reinvent the past, but going forward, we should, one thing this committee could do is we could outline some guidelines in the future for how you keep those records, saving them. Uh, and the like. I think that may be, be, be helpful. I don't know. I mean, the fact that you had different, um, uh, uh, you know, servers and, and, and computers keeping these things in itself is compliant with the law. Yeah, the notion of, of having a separate computer to do political work in the White House makes sense. It just shouldn't be doing your official work on that computer. Right. And that would mean that for the political parties, now, all the emails wouldn't have gone, I mean, if it was an RNC or a DNC computer um, that you were keeping there, we, maybe we ought to put out guidelines for preservation of records which currently don't exist. Would that be a recommendation might come out of here that could be helpful going forward? I, I would think so. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, the White House Council issues records management guidance for all White House employees that they uh, <clears throat> should be doing and I think did do, in fact. They, there is guidance to that effect or, uh, in, at some level, I believe, by mm -hmm. the White House. But this is, I mean, uh, the email, this is fairly new. This has evolved over the last decade, and it may be appropriate, Mr. Waxman, at the right time, for at least going forward, that we put out some, some hard and fast rules. Uh, Mr. Weinstein, do you, you have any uh, thoughts I'm on, in that? Total agreement on that? One, I'm in total agreement with that, uh, uh, Mr. Davis. One, one of the uh, points I would like to make is about the, the cost of this. Apparently, this process of recovering or restoring the emails from the Clinton years cost about $12 million and took about two years to, to achieve. So these are not cost-free issues. I got you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Strice, Thank you. Uh, sort of finishing up uh, with uh, Mr. McDevitt, uh, my understanding from staff uh, is that the call that was made, uh, they were prohibited from asking certain probative questions. Uh, one of them clearly would be, is uh, Mr. McDevitt working with crew in private litigation? Certainly, that'd be a fair question if he were here before us today. Uh, another one would be, you know, were the interrogatories that he submitted the result of back and forth work with the majority? Certainly, I'd like to know that. Lastly, I might note for the panel uh, before us that Mr. McDevitt, uh, a federal employee at FEMA, chose, uh, even though he's a past White House employee, chose to use his Gmail account to correspond back and forth with us. Uh, uh, as to whether or not he could give testimony. Uh, and, and I think, Mr. Stern, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you if you don't mind. Is it appropriate to use Gmail when you're a federal employee and a committee of Congress is asking you questions? Or would that have been something that he should have done on his FEMA account since he is a federal employee and he was contacted in the ordinary course of previous federal employment? Um, well. Ultimately, like we said, whether something is, constitutes official government business and therefore a government record has to be preserved whatever system you use it on. People do use their home email accounts if they're working from home and don't have access to their government account. Uh, so the fact of mere use of a, of a private account for government business isn't prohibited. It just needs to be preserved according to whatever okay. government record so, keeping laws so, apply. But Gmail is not, uh, is not something where you can easily catch the archive on it. Uh, Mr. Weinstein, uh, Dr. Weinstein, are, are you keeping all of the uh, YouTube uh, stuff that's up on the President? Are you keeping all the other activities, that the things that, that show up on the Internet for President uh, Bush and his administration, are you capturing that? Because certainly it's part of the, 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 the total Internet, uh, but not part of, the, uh, of Ms. Payton's uh, normal capturing. What, what's 
What specifically would you be referring to? Well, if, mm. if the chairman thinks that he should have Karl Rove's every thinking, including correspondence mm. with a wife <clears throat> or a girlfriend or uh, an old buddy, uh, because it was done at the RNC and not official, uh, sort of this voyeur peeping Tom that you're entitled to everything, the question is, are you capturing everything, or, in fact, are you leaving a huge amount that's out there not there? Do you capture every utterance of the president, no matter where he is, for example? Congressman, I think you know the answer to that question. I do. And, and, and unfortunately, the only time I have is the time to say that this committee was supposed to be looking into the failure to keep 200 days. It continues to shrink worth of, of email. Uh, but it's very clear that it's Karl Rove's non-official activities, activities that, for example, were uh, related to fundraising or other activities, maybe strategizing how the Republicans in the House could have kept the majority rather than become part of the minority, which I suspect Karl Rove did at the RNC. He probably did that, and uh, as would his successor in a, in a Democrat administration. So my question is, if Karl Rove over at the RNC chose to decide that uh, that, uh, let's say, talking about fundraising or talking about strategizing how to maintain a majority in the House or the Senate, uh, if he did something on an email, would that be appropriate for you to gather at this point? Mr. Stein, you're shaking your head no. I assume that you've got an answer to that, that that's not appropriate, right? Again, the Presidential Records Act uh, pretty clearly defines what's a presidential record and what's not a presidential record and says, uh, activities by officials for purely political purposes, campaigns, re-election of the president, all are non-records and should not be maintained by the government system. And not they don't come to the National Archives as presidential records. So it's it's entirely appropriate to conduct that business on a separate system. I think the issue okay. is always was there also official government presidential records on that system. That's what we would be interested in. Well, but but in getting is at. there any evidence that any of you have that there is official government presidential records there, or are we simply going on a fishing expedition at forty or fifty thousand dollars a month of uh, of campaign funds at the RNC uh, because we have the power of <clears throat> subpoena? Uh, and we'll forget the second half of that for a moment. <clears throat> Do any of you know of any official deliberative required under law? not nice to have, but required under law that was done at the RNC. And obviously, correspondence from the government to the RNC, you've already got. You'll, you'll capture that. We're talking about use of, of other servers and other emails not related to the government. Do any of you know of a, a single document, because this committee doesn't, a single document that should have been in the archives, but in fact was, uh, was done at the RNC? Well, two, two points, Congressman. First of all, uh, it's, it's hard to know anything before we have some okay. information. Now, we, that's the, the whole point. The We're not entitled. No, no, but no, Chairman, this is my time, if you don't mind. You've used plenty of time that is not allocated time under the committee rules. I, I need to be as simplistic as possible because we have limited time. If you know of any, you say yes. If you don't know of any, you say no. I understand that there might be some there that we don't know of. But there might be some on YouTube. There might be some. Uh, the president may have had a conversation, a deliberative conversation, well, at a fundraiser. He may have done that. But it's not being captured by you today, nor is, oh, nor is there a burden under law to go get it to see, is there? You have no mandate to go uh, peeping Tom into every piece of correspondence that people say is private not. in order to determine whether it might not. be public. Of course not. OK. But, but this so, but, I mean, it's important for today because Ms. Pat, uh, Payton, I think, has very important information for us that there will be a certain amount of days of re-imaging servers with the images you captured as the typical backup you do. It's much faster, obviously, to capture an image than to do a sequential backup. You captured images. If you're lucky, you capture one and you get 80 days worth of back or 30 days worth of back emails. If you're not lucky, you may have to go day after day after day to capture them. And I appreciate the fact that sometimes those images, they're not 100 percent perfect. You might not be able to restore a server, and that may be lost. And it may be millions of dollars. But the committee's legitimate reason for calling this today, as I understand, is not the RNC. It's whether or not you can capture that and, wh and what it will cost. And I think you've given us a great answer, that if all we care about is Dr. Weinstein's ability to get 
the legitimate archives that we know should be available to the, 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 the history of America, you're going to be able to provide that in all likelihood, all or virtually all. So now I get back to the same thing in the remaining time, and I'll ask each of you, do any of you know of something that was wrong, wrongly used outside official channels by Karl Rove, because it's clear the chairman, uh, a little bit like Dan Burton, who I disagreed with some of what he did in the 90s, the, he's clearly wanting to know what, what, what Karl Rove said or did, even if Karl Rove didn't deliver it as official work. And the question is, do any of you know of any misconduct by Karl Rove using the RNC to circumvent what would otherwise be official, legitimate activities covered under the Records Act? Do any of you know of that? Yes or no, please. Yes or no? Yes or no? I mean, do you know or don't you know? You don't know? I, I would say that, that the question itself is both above and below my pay grade. It's just as... Okay. But, <laughs> well, Mr. Chairman, I will, time Mr. Chairman I will take that as a no, and thank you. I would take it as more than a no. Uh, for, uh, for the record, the White House has the responsibility of preserving all of the emails. And if some of the emails are at the Republican National Committee, the White House has a responsibility to get them. But only those that relate to federal work, government uh, activities. And when we know that, the, for the record, that there are uh, uh, 51 of the 88 White House officials who had RNC email accounts, and then we uh, don't know what's happened to 37 of those 51, and before 2006, only 14 of these officials uh, had emails even retained at all, and that Karl Rove, for example, used 99% of his time on RNC emails, one would assume he was doing some government work. But we don't know unless we see the emails. And if we don't see the emails, we Mr. don't Chairman, know. Mr. do you presume that we have a right to, to look into private people's lives simply because Absolutely there not. might be something there? Absolutely not. Well, but the White House has an obligation to have the official business of the White House on emails that are preserved. And they need to be preserved whether they're on one account or another. Mr. Chairman, I, I truly agree with you on that. And that's why we've been cooperating as a minority. But I would hope that we would ask the White House, just as I asked here, are there any records that are covered under official deliberation in the, in the Records Act that have been conducted under any non-government service by any individuals? And, and ask them to answer well, that. Well, Mr. Swinham, that's a good question. Are there government uh, activities that are handled on an RNC email account when we have so many employees of the highest level in the White House with no official records of their emails and we know that they use their RNC accounts for everything that they send on emails? Well, much of the things that you've talked about, uh, Mr. Chairman, have preceded my coming to the uh, position of uh, Director of the Office of Administration. Uh, well, then we, it's improper for us to ask you. But you are here representing the White House. I Let me go on to members uh, who uh, are waiting for their opportunity to ask questions. Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And you know, as I listen to that discussion, I just happen to have in my hand a report that says investigation of possible Presidential Records Act violations. And information in the report indicates that White House officials use their RNC email accounts to conduct official business. So I'm not sure that we have to speculate about that. I think that we actually have the information that's been investigated and actually is, is written in a report. So I think we can move on. But let me uh, move on to my questions. Uh, Dr. Weinstein, as I understand the White House email problem, this all began in 2002 when the White House decided to move its staff from the Lotus Notes email system to the Microsoft Exchange email system. But when the White House switched away from the old email system, it also abandoned the archiving system that went with it. This archiving system was called the Automatic Records Management System, or ARMS, and had been used since the Clinton administration. The problem was that instead of putting in place a new archiving system, the White House began an ad hoc process <coughs> called journaling. And under this process, a White House staffer or contractor would collect copies of emails 
and manually save them on various White House servers. The committee interviewed Carlos Solari, who was Ms. Payton's predecessor as the White House Chief Information Officer, and he told us that this journal in process was, and I quote, a temporary and short-term solution that was not considered a good long-term solution. Dr. Weinstein, your own staff had a similar reaction. In an email sent last November, Sam Watkins with the archive said that the archive and system used by the White House, and I quote, hardly qualifies as a system, end of quote, by the usual IT definition. My question is, do you agree with this ad hoc journal in process was not an ideal email archiving system? Congressman, may I first <coughs> compliment you on a very brief distilled analysis <coughs> of the systems, which I'm afraid I could not match. So we'll, we'll start with the fact that I'm a very low-tech person, and so I'm gonna, I've only been at the archives for three years. But I think the judgment of that system will have to be made by colleagues who have watched this over, the, unfortunately, I'm not even sure Mr. Watkins is here. Is he here? Yeah, no. Gary, would, would take sure. One? So we'll, we'll listen to my counsel on that one. So you would not say that this was an ideal well, system? Well, I think when one has to change any system completely, or one decides to change any system completely, you're going to run into not simply the normal obstacles, but that wonderful historical, I'm a historian by profession, and the law of unintended consequences is the only major historical law which I know, which is it the, only, the only Dr. Weinstein, we're having a hard time hearing you. Pull the it right up The only law here. I know which is, uh, which is absolutely inv infallible for historians is the law of unintended consequences. And I'm sure there were some in the, in the change from one system to another. But, but perhaps Mr. Stern had, knows of some specifics here. Well, let me ask you, Mr. Stern or Ms. Fawcett, do you have any concerns about the adequacy of the White House archiving system? Uh, I think, uh, and as the documents we provided the committee reflect, it, was, it, was, it had been our understanding that the journaling function was meant to be temporary stopgap uh, until they put in a new formal records management application, uh, which uh, we had spent some time working with them in the, during the first term of the President, and uh, which we still uh, had uh, hoped and expected they would put in a new formal system. Uh, so I think, uh, as, as the quote you indicated, uh, or you quoted from, indicates that it's our view uh, that the journaling function is not the ideal solution. And it's been used for six years. So, so I want to ask Dr. Weinstein, do you have any concerns right. about how long <clears throat> this system has been used or the White House has continued to rely upon a non-productive system? Congressman, in fairness to the White House, what I'd like to see is the results of what my colleague here, is, Ms. Payton, is doing. She, she, you indicated that your process is coming to a com com completion soon. I'd like to hear the results of what Mr. Swendemans and his colleagues have come up with. And it's, it's, it seems to me to be unfair to, to judge that system before we've seen it in operation. And this is literally the first time that it can be seen in full operation. So well, let me ask Ms. Payton how she would respond to that or if she has any concerns about it. Um, if your question, Mr. Davis, I just want to make sure you un I understand the question um, you're asking me is around, um, is it an ideal solution? We, we, we used it, I mean, the White House has continued to use it mm -hmm. pretty much knowing that it was not yielding the kind of results that, that you'd want to have it yield. I, I think this is a, a, a very complex challenge, um, and it's not as simple to say, um, this is the right software product and this is the wrong software product. And what I've been able to gather from the people who have been here um, prior to my arrival, um, as well as some of the documents that I've read, is uh, best efforts have been made to actually do a more comprehensive solution. Uh, but once the products had to run through their paces um, through some of the unique and demanding uh, requirements that EOP has, they have to do both Presidential Records and Federal Records Act management. They have to separate things out by components and they have to be able to uh, record key statistics so that they can do searches. And it, it appears that each time those products were run through the paces, um, they were left wanting. And so um, that's, that's been the challenge. So 
part of what we've been doing in knowing that we want a more comprehensive solution. Um, this is not the solution that uh, we want to live on for, for the rest of uh, the time that we're on exchange, barring whatever the next platform is that comes out for email. Um, we know that we want to move um, to a newer platform. However, in the meantime, you have to make do with what you have and make sure the processes around it are tight, make sure that people are trained, and as much as you can improve the technology around it to make sure the processes um, capture any potential problems that may happen. A comprehensive solution still doesn't account for, if you have poor processes around a comprehensive solution, if it breaks, you're still going to have challenges. And I think we've seen that in the industry. I'm not going to um, you know, mention by name some of the um, large companies that have had challenges with this that do have more comprehensive solutions. So I, I hope I'm answering your question, Mr. Davis. Um, you know, would it be what my staff and I would have picked um, if we could have had the ideal world? Probably not, but it is the solution we have, and our focus is on making sure it's accurate, reliable, stable, and has good processes around it until we can get on a more comprehensive solution. Thank, Thank you, you very much. The gentleman's Thank time you, has expired. Uh, Mr. Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 16 years is, uh, you've been, I think, Mr. Chairman, you've been on the committee longer. I, I'm sure you have, uh, but I've been on 16 years. It's interesting how uh, what comes around sort of goes around. Was here with um, uh, this this discussion reminded me of uh, with the Clinton administration and the missing FBI files and those weren't emails those were FBI files remember Craig Livingstone and uh, I think Mrs. Clinton was in the middle of that one too but uh, it's interesting how it uh, sort of just all comes around full circle now we're looking for some emails and this does uh, it ra raises an interesting question because we've gone from like hard FBI files and and documents uh, to uh, the electronic era I had a good discussion with uh, the librarian of Congress because the same things happening um, with Congress uh, you used to have all these great uh, doc well you have uh, uh, the archivist has uh, an incredible collection of hard copies. I think it's uh, um, just one of the most fabulous things I've ever seen is to go into the archives. And you do a, uh, generally a magnificent job of preserving those, uh, those documents. But we're entering a new era in trying to sort out sort of the rules of how you preserve uh, electronic uh, communications. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Peyton, uh, the, uh, the Stephen McDivitt that uh, has made some allegations uh, was part of the reason that he uh, was upset was that uh, I'd heard that was there was a difference in technology he wanted to implement. Are you aware of that to, as far as re uh, recording uh, uh, emails and things of that and preserving them? Did you? Uh, or are, are you aware of that, uh, Mr. Wine? Dr. Weinstein. Well, <clears throat> obviously, it, 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 in, an, in an ideal world, which is, you know, Congressman, is the world we live in, uh, it would be best if all concerned had, comfort, had a very high comfort level with the technology they were using. I'm not uh, privy to the specific arguments involved with technological debate over what to do at the White House in this regard. I am at the National Archives. But, but was I, there a difference of opinion as to how the records were kept? Uh, do you know? I'm not sure if there was. Did, 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 did you have a difference of opinion? With? Well, if there wasn't, uh, we would have one protocol and everything would, would I mean, things would be, would be saved and obviously some things are missing. Mr. Waxman would like to find well, them. But at, at, but at the staff levels, it seems to me that one, one of the things that keeps the system working is a, a remarkable amount of civility back and forth normally between the staffs in terms of getting basic things done. For example, but, technological you know, and, choices. And the, the high regard I have for the archives that Mr. Stern, I think you were involved in the Sandy Berger uh, issue, and I asked for Sandy, I asked uh, that we we find out about the missing papers. Now, Sandy Berger had uh, uh, top secret classified documents. He was charged by President Clinton to report to the 9/11. Commission and he had access and uh, misplaced top secret documents. Is that not correct, Ms. Mr. Stern? 
he had access, he had clearance? Uh, I mean, well, I could answer your question if you'd like. It seems that that's uh, obviously a separate topic from what this hearing no, is about. No, but your charge, uh, it's just like, it's gonna, I'm going to ask Ms. Payton about the Clinton, you're charged with keeping presidential records. The Clinton records, uh, isn't there a hold on some of those being released uh, now for the Clinton Library? Ms. Payton, is that uh, correct? My understanding is they're at NARA, sort of in a kind of a temporary area until all of them are. So we can't get access to presidential records from that administration. And then the archives, which does its best in preserving them, particularly a new mode of communications, which is electronic. Uh, we take top secret hard documents that were stuffed, uh, according to Mr. Lasseter's, uh, Laster's uh, email, which uh, I'd like to make a uh, part of the record, Mr. Chairman. We'll uh, uh, accept it for review and not make a part of the record. Okay, good. But it, it refers to his uh, e uh, email as to how those documents were preserved. And I guess they were stuffed in Sandy Berger's uh, socks. Is that? What you understand, Mr. S Mr. Stern? There's been a lot of review uh, and investigation by lots of folks about what Mr. Berger did. But there's emails that say one thing, and then the IG report says another thing, and I want them to be made part of the record. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the chair will not admit that in the record. That has nothing to do with this hearing. Uh, Ms. Watson? Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I want to address my remarks to Ms. Pay uh, Ms. Payton. And uh, Ms. Payton, to comply with the Presidential Records Act, an email archiving system has to ensure that it captures all pertinent email, but it also has to prevent people who are unauthorized from tampering with or deleting email. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Ms. And the Watson. committee has been informed that in 2005, the White House was warned not only that a system, what is was at risk of data loss, but also that it was vulnerable to tampering. And uh, Mr. Uh, McDewitt, who worked for you at the White House, correct? He did work for you? Yes, I started uh, mid-May of 2006. Uh-huh. Informed the committee that there is no way to guarantee that all records are retained in their complete and unmodified state. And he said, the approach of simply storing email messages in PST files provides no mechanisms or audit trail that tracks changes to data files. And according to him, the integrity of the data could be called into question because it was not possible to ensure that inappropriate action, either intentional or unintentional, could not occur. So this doesn't necessarily mean that someone tampered with White House documents, but it does mean there is no way to know if someone did. And um, let me then address uh, this to Dr. Weinstein. Does this uh, raise the concerns for you that there could be tampering? Congresswoman, <clears throat> anything of this kind raises concerns for me. Any, any possibility of tampering in any fashion because of an, of a, of an unfortunate employee. I know, but systems. are you concerned about that? Am I concerned about this specific issue that you raised? That they, it could be tamp the data could be tampered with? I'd like to see some of the material, if I may. That I can't hear you, I'd sir. I'd like to read through some of the material that you have in front of you to, so that I can judge no. for myself. Give me a yes or no. Are yes. you concerned? I'm always concerned. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes is sure. your answer. Yes is my yeah, answer. Yeah, it's just a simple question. Okay. Well, well. Uh, Mr. McDewitt also well, raised another concern, and this one is even more serious. He stated that there was a critical security issue in this system that was not identified and corrected until 2005. And he said this during this period, it was discovered that the file servers and the file directories used to store the retained email PST files were accessible by everyone on the EOP network. Now, Ms. Payton, the executive officer of the president 
has several thousand people, and your former employee, Mr. McDewitt, is saying that until 2005, any of them could access these email files. They could delete files, they could modify files, or read the files of other officials. Is that correct? Um, Ms. Watson, since that precedes me, I'm going to go off of um, information um, based on conversations with my staff. And in asking and trying to understand the email situation so we have the right course of action and the right people matched to it, that has not been brought up. Um, I mean, at some point in time, I can certainly go back and, and ask them about that. That has not been brought up, um, nor is that typical. Uh, let me stop you. Are yes, you saying to me that it has not been brought up that these files could be deleted or tampered with? That there was system-wide access by 3,000 customers to servers that are in the data center. That is um, against, you know, sort of technology 101 principles. Uh, if, th if that uh, happened, please, we'd please, have to do some research please. on that. It would appear to me that if you had a system in place where it could be accessed by 3,000 people or unofficial personnel and it could be changed, you mean to say that there was no concern or discussion? Is that what I'm to hear? I have not been made aware that at some point in time that these servers were open to just anybody. So as I understand it, and please correct me, uh, you had a system in place in the White House for several years in which anyone could have gone in and deleted files without a trace. Ma'am, I, I do not know that to be um, true. I, I have not been told that. Gentlelady's time has expired. Mr. Duncan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. L let me uh, let me just ask that again. I think I think maybe it's uh, I think maybe you just answered this. But do you have you you do uh, realize, of course, you're under oath. Do you have any uh, knowledge of any kind that any person has ever tampered with or deleted any of these files? I, I have no knowledge of anybody going out there and intentionally deleting files that should not be deleted. Right. All right. Uh, I mean, I mean, and again, we're referring to a time period before my time, but I've, I've not had an employee come to me and say this is something that needs to be researched and that's been con that anything has happened. So I, I don't know, I don't know what to do with that statement. So you have no knowledge of anybody purposely trying to hide or delete something from this uh, committee or from any government investigator? That's correct. I mean, there, there's only one exception that is allowed as far as any kind of uh, delete, and that has to go through a very specific process, and that's only in the event that information from the classified network is found on the unclassified network, and that is the only time that a, a delete is allowed to happen, and that um, is managed through a very tight process. Uh, Mr. Swindeman, uh, let me ask you, or Ms. Payton, either one, uh, how, how many times uh, uh, has your staff, uh, or either of you, or your staff uh, uh, briefed oversight committee staff, and, and can you tell us how many letters of inquiry uh, you've received from the committee? I've briefed uh, the oversight uh, staff uh, once uh, very recently in terms of being responsive to the uh, committee. Uh, we have certainly in hand um, uh, the chairman's letter and uh, we have been producing the documents uh, that uh, were requested. Uh, that has uh, consumed approximately, given last check of about February 8th, about 1,500 hours of time from the OA staff uh, to do that, and that's staff across the board. That's not just the OCIO's office, but it's uh, the, the chief financial officer, the chief operating officer, the <coughs> procurement uh, division, and so forth. That's really what I was getting at is some idea about how many, how much staff time or how many hours or how many, uh, how much has been devoted to trying to find uh, this information, do, you, do, you, do either of you have any idea about how many uh, documents or uh, interviews of, of uh, 
have been, have been submitted? Uh, how many pages of documents have come here to the committee in well, regard of, to this uh, investigation? As of right now, I think the estimate uh, that I have been given is, is that approximately 15,000 pages of documents have been produced to the committee and approximately another 15,000 have been shown to the committee. So 1,500 hours and 15,000 pages? Approximately, sir. Uh, Mr. Duncan, since yes. you addressed it to both of us, sure. Alan, Alan covered the OA um, portion, which would cover my area, but in addition to that, you'd ask the question about briefings, and I have provided, if, if I remember correctly, it's been four briefings, two in person, um, two via telephone um, on, on this topic to um, committee staff. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Payton, uh, I'd like to ask you about some emails that were missing from Vice President Cheney's office that were related to um, CIA agent Valerie Plain Wilson. Uh, before I get to any questions, let me see if I have the chronology right, and I know you'll correct me if I'm wrong on that. I understand that first your office produced a chart in 2005 that showed 473 days with no email sent to or from certain components of the White House in the Microsoft Exchange system. For the Vice President's office, there were days during the week of October 1, 2003 with no email, and that was apparently of interest to Special Counsel Patrick Fitzgerald, who requested those documents during the period. My understanding is that when the inventory was done in 2005, nobody at the White House could locate those email, emails in the PST files that were stored in the servers. And now, as far as I know, in 2008, you still, the White House still hasn't located those emails in the PST files in the White House servers. So after not finding the emails there, the White House went to backup tapes and ultimately recovered emails for those days, and these were provided to the special counsel. Is that pretty accurate so far? Yes. Okay. So my first question, I guess, is what happened to the files that were supposed to be on the White House servers? Well, we have not finished our analysis, Mr. Tierney. Um, we, we still have roughly 17 million emails as we're going through this first pass that we have not attributed to a component. And in our phase two, we'll have enhanced technology, which will allow us to read those messages at a lower level and, and attribute those to a component. Okay. But so far, I mean, this is a long period of time that's transpired. Now you haven't found them, and you went through a pretty serious effort in trying to respond to special counsel Patrick Fitzgerald, I would assume, and found none of them on the servers and had to go to the backup, right? Uh, at, yes, and, and um, that, that is correct. Let me ask you about the backup tapes then. Uh, they're supposed to, as far as I know, uh, copy everything in the White House servers, right? They're disaster recovery backup tapes, so they actually take a picture of how things look in the data center at that day. Right. So it's a picture of the server, the applications on it, and then any data associated with the applications. So it should copy the journals, the PST files, and everybody's individual mailboxes. Yes. Now, we got uh, a document showing that when the White House restored the backup tapes for the Vice President's office, there were no journal files. There were no PST files containing emails for the days that Mr. Fischer was interested in. So not only were they missing from the servers, they were missing from the backup tapes as well. Can you explain that to us? Because this predates me, I don't know all the details of that particular restore. I, I do well, know that Does it mean that, that there were no journal files at the time the backup tape was made? I, I'm not sure. I, I, what I do know is that 70 mailboxes were restored and 17,000 emails, but I don't know all the details of that particular restoral process. Well, I would assume, you know, the problem with just having the, e the mailboxes of individual officials of the Vice President's office is my understanding is that if somebody deletes an email the same day that they receive it, it's just gone. It's, it's not stored or whatever. We'll never know what was on there, so no historical uh, record of that. So I'm looking at this, and without being an expert, it looks like there's a lot of unanswered questions here about the emails that were missing from the Vice President's office. Mr. We, Tierney, yeah. if, if I might, sure. we, ha we still have PST files that we have not been able to associate with a component. I'm assuming that was the same case back in 2005, but I don't know that for sure. They contain 17 million emails. Once we go through phase two, um, it is our um, hope and, and our, our uh, assumption that we're going to be able to find uh, emails that were properly archived, but they're just not associated with a component at this point in time. Well, I hope you'll forgive me for being a little bit skeptical because a lot of time has, has come and gone. I understand. On this, the servers didn't have it. It looks like the backup certainly, at least to date, hasn't had it despite fairly extensive 
efforts to recapture that. And, you know, you want us to rely on this system to believe that, you know, this is something that's reliable, and, and I just don't see that uh, at this point in time. Uh, and it's disconcerting. I mean, the, the, all the other questions that we're seeing here today about the RNC uh, being deleting tapes and everything disappearing, these are critical periods of time where the historical record should be accurate and should be complete. Uh, and the amount of time that it has taken uh, to review all of these things and still come up with non-answers is, is disturbing. So I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, th th do you have that? Uh, Mr. Bilbray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Stearns, I had the privilege of having a uh, discussion with Mary Nichols, who previously was EPA and now over at Air, Air Resources Board, and um, about an issue that actually is raised here, and that's the California waiver and the hearing and the process on that. In fact, we um, I've noticed that uh, a group that is um, called themselves um, Citizens for Responsible Ethics in Washington crew has filed a lawsuit pertaining to the latest lack of a waiver for California um, pertaining to greenhouse gases. So, Stern, do you know if they filed a lawsuit pertaining to the mandate to use ethanol in California that California tried to get a waiver for from the Clinton administration and was blocked by that administration? Do you know if they filed anything? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm with the National Archives. I'm not familiar with that issue, EPA issue at all. Okay. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just don't know if that group was involved in a, any litigation pertaining to the other waiver, but I am interested in this. And Mr. Weinstein, uh, Weinstein, what do we have the possibility of, if we wanted to follow up on this other waiver, to get into the records of the Clinton administration about what was done and and why they would not issue a waiver to California Air Resources Board when we requested it for over eight years? <clears throat> I think it would depend, Congressman, on whether those records had already been totally processed for, for release. Gary, you want to take that? Yeah, under the Presidential Records Act, the Congress uh, wait, through... Excuse me, wait. Uh, under you. the Presidential Records Act, the Congress through uh, a, commi a committee or a subcommittee can make us what we call a special access request for records of a former president. So if we got a formal request from the committee for records uh, in, uh, presidential records from the Clinton administration, then we would respond to that, search for those <coughs> records, see if we have them at the Clinton <coughs> Library, and respond to the committee. So there is a formal process through the PRA to do that. But that would have to be the chairman of the committee responding. The chairman of the committee would have to request that? That's correct. Right. Okay. Uh, because it is an ongoing problem, as m the Chairman Waxman knows, we're uh, concerned about the environmental impact of mm -hmm. the ethanol methanol mandate. We've gotten the methanol off, but we still have a mandate on ethanol. And why the administration, previous administration, kept telling us that they were going to pull the mandate and never did, and what meetings and communications they had with industry representatives who were representing <coughs> those who were profiteering off of this mandate as opposed to where we go. So that's obviously now, now the concern is what kind of contacts the Republican administration that followed made specifically to greenhouse gas issues. Um, Mr. Chairman, at this time I'd like to uh, yield my remaining time to uh, the gentleman from Florida. Uh, Ms. Payton, um, you joined the Office of uh, Administration in mid-2006, so all the missing uh, email issues occurred exclusively before your tenure, tenure began, is that correct? I mean, yes, I mean, it, th that's correct. Okay. And we've got uh, were you around when these things took place, too? Uh, no, uh, Mr. You Mike. You were not? No, I, my so tenure began November 27th sort of, of 2000. There's sort of a little game being played here. This Stephen Mc, McDivitt, he worked for you. Did he, he leave on good terms, or was there some dispute? He's the sort of the accuser here, bringing up that they could have had a system that would have been better, that would have preserved things, and some may, things may be missing, they may not, but he's raised these questions, right? Uh, he did initially work, report directly to me, um, and then once I got a deputy director, he reported to the deputy director. Um, Steve, um, uh, was there, there had to be some disagreement. I mean, are, were you aware that? Uh, I mean, now he's making these charges that y'all didn't handle this right. 
Uh, he was uh, very passionate about um, the, the ECRAMS platform um, that was mm -hmm. uh, going to go to pilot, and the pilot ha had to keep being delayed. Um, and he was, uh, you so know. So there was a disagreement on, on how this would these records would be preserved? We actually did not make the decision around ECRAMS until okay. after he um, left. Okay, important question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one of the things I passed after the Clinton fiasco was the White House had to live under all the laws the rest of us did. I think Mr. Ehlers and I passed that uh, after we went through years of seeing the uh, disorganization at the White House and noncompliance with law under the Clinton administration. Do we need to change the law? Is there something? Because, again, we have new technology that we're trying to capture history. Uh, let's go right down the line. Uh, uh, tell me if you think that the law is adequate or something we need to change. Gentlemen's time has expired, but if any members wish to answer his, uh, any think, witnesses wish to answer his question. I think question. with regards to uh, law or rules on technology, I need to defer to somebody who is an expert in IT okay. and has a technological background. Um, it, as far as uh, the law goes, um, I can't legal, legally comment on whether or not the law should be changed, um, but the fact that more communication that used to happen in the hallway and used to happen on the telephone now happens on email. So email volumes are, are driving up, and it's now, um, you know, it's, it's also a very casual form of communication as well as a very official form of communication. And so um, we do have some work to do both on the, um, the user side as well as on the technology side to understand the new protocols around managing, uh, restore, you know, ha um, preserving it properly, managing it, planning for that type of volume, because it's only going to increase. Did, did I get at the heart of your question, sir? Well, the question was, you, you recommend a new law. You're not recommending a new law. Uh, let's uh, go. Th if anybody wants to answer his question directly, let's do that, and, because other members are waiting to ask their questions. And the gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Weinstein. Mr. Chairman, as you know, I'm a historian by profession, and I'm afraid I'm too old to respond to that question, certainly not without, not without you and the, the honorable member agreeing on a particular thing. When, when there's consensus in this body, and that, that's the moment that probably the law should, should, should move forward. I'll stop there. Okay. Anybody else want to respond? If not, uh, Mr. Yarmouth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to ask a question that's based on a conversation I had several years ago before I ever dreamed of getting into politics while I was a journalist. And I actually had forgotten about this conversation, but I was reminded of it when all of these uh, disappearing emails uh, when the story of them arose, a woman told me, this is back in 2004, 2005, that she had a blood relative who worked for a private contractor somewhere in a remote area from D.C. I don't remember whether it was Virginia or Maryland. And that every six weeks or so, he came, his company came to the White House and took computers and hard drives back to a remote location where he was many stories underground. And I'm not exactly clear on which term she used, whether she said clean or scrubbed the hard drives in those computers. Now, she, I'm very honest to say, implied a nefarious motive. I, as a journalist, uh, wasn't quite sure, and I understand the dangers of hearsay stories like that. And I wouldn't even ask the question except for the connection to missing data. So my question is to Mr. Swindeman and Ms. Payton, uh, are you aware of any activity or procedure that resembles the activity that I just described? Uh, sir, I, I'm aware of none. Um, I can't comment on that time period, but I can comment currently. Mm -hmm. um, so there, uh, there are, um, as employees depart, if we want to be able to reuse their equipment, mm -hmm. um, we actually take the files and mm -hmm. store them on a shared drive. Um, and then if we want to reuse their equipment, we would need to wipe their drive so that we're not buying a new PC and then you can't use it anymore every time you have a new person. So from a, a current standpoint, um, that's a, a, a practice that we're using. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, it may. Uh, let me be a little, uh, ask another one, though. Is there any, um, are you aware of any contract with a non-governmental entity that involves um, handling of White House computer information? 
We, well, we have six. Other than, other than the one you just may have just described. Yeah, I mean, we have 60 contractors on staff who um, help us with our messaging, um, who also help us with our, our um, PC tech support. Um, so contractors would be touching computers. And I, this process that she's mentioning, I'm, I'm not sure I'm aware of. OK. And um, so you don't, well, OK, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But let me ask a question about, you, you mentioned one issue with regard to um, deleting information that might be classified. And you described it as being subject to a very tight process. I think those were your words. Mm -hmm. uh, what, how can we as a committee, how can the Congress, how can the American people be confident that uh, what that process is and that there's any accountability for it? Or are we relying totally on the White House's assurance that it is a tight process that only deals with classified information? I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how to answer your question. Um, I mean, it's... I mean, would you be willing to, for instance, describe the tight process that you use? Sure. I, I, I can definitely walk you through. Um, well, I, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just got um, guidance that because we're talking about classified, I, I can't talk about um, the details of classified in the setting. Um, so I'll just tell you organizationally, we have an Office of Security Emergency Preparedness. Mm -hmm. If they're notified, they notify us. We get our direction and we follow our direction. Okay. Doesn't sound like a very tight process, but I'll let you characterize that. Uh, I want to ask you now about the ECRAMS program. You made the decision to cancel that program after uh, what was described to the committee by Mr. McDevitt as a pretty extensive three-year uh, process uh, in which a lot of different people made a decision that this was the system that was uh, desirable to implement. And you made that decision, and you've given in your written testimony some reasons for it. Um, you gave, uh, apparently in meeting with Mr. Stern's staff, you gave some slightly different reasons. And I'd like to ask Mr. Stern, did you think and did your staff think that Ms. Payton's reasons for canceling the ECRAMS program were um, legitimate and were compelling? I'm really not in a position to answer that. Uh, I mean, we defer to them, and it's the White House's responsibility to make the records management decisions. We certainly, as we've st said before, hoped and expected they'd have uh, a formal records management system in place. We thought that ECRAMS was going to be it. Um, so we were disappointed that they didn't use ECRAMS uh, and would hope that they still uh, try to get one in place even now if they can. My time is up, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Welch? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank all the witnesses. I want to focus on uh, the recovery of some of the emails uh, and what efforts have been made to, to, uh, to do that. Uh, I don't really want to focus on motives or what we can prove when we don't have the documentation to draw any re realistic conclusions. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Stern, uh, the Presidential Records Act of course, requires that official business be available uh, and then stored in the repository of the National Archives, correct? Correct. And it's your responsibility uh, to, uh, to see that that uh, is done? Correct. To, to ensure that all the records, presidential records in the White House are transferred into our custody. Right. And whether uh, an official action uh, uh, involving White House business is done on the White House email account or an RNC uh, account or a Gmail account or AOL account, if it's official business, it belongs in the archives, correct? Ultimately, at the end of the administration, it, 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 it should be preserved as a presidential record right. and then transferred to us. And we know that about 88 the White House officials, in fact, used a non-White House mail account to do some official business uh, for whatever reason, correct? I guess I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the details of that. I think I, it was my understanding that there was at least some some uh, uh, belief, even by the White House, that there could be official right. business done on the RNC system. Yeah. And the, so, in, you've you've made specific inquiries from the White House about having them obtain from the RNC the emails that relate to official White House business. Correct? Yes, we we asked them to do that. You asked them to do that in May of of '07. I believe so. And what did they do? as a result of that request? 
We, we don't know specifically. They said they were attempting to do that, and we've inquired periodically, and, and, and we don't know any more, anything specific except that we thought they were still continuing in that All effort. Right. Since you made the request in May of 07 for the White House to gather up its emails that were used on an RNC account, are you aware of any specific concrete step that the White House has taken to comply with that request? No. Do they have a legal duty to provide official communication records to the archive? At the end of the administration, yes. Okay. Ms. Payton, are you aware of any specific and concrete step that the White House has taken to comply with the request by Mr. Stern on behalf of the National Archives to obtain these emails? Um, Mr. Welch, because that's a separate technology team that reports up through RNC, I'm not involved so in that. So the answer is it's not your job, so you don't know. That's correct, okay, sir. Mr. Swindeman, how about you? Well, the uh, Office of Administration is responsible for the official, sensitive but official EOP network. It's, it's not So it's not your job either? It is not. All right. So the, nobody here can speak for the White House and explain to Mr. Stern why they haven't do done what they told Mr. Stern they would do, namely make those uh, presidential, uh, those, uh, those communications subject to the Presidential Records Act uh, 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 available to the National Archives. You well, don't know. Well, I've tr I think I've tried to explain as, as I understand it, sir, as to what steps I've been told have been undertaken. No, I, I want to know, well, he knows of no steps. Is he misinformed? I'm not privy to the communications that Mr. Stern has had with, uh, uh, with. Well, let me ask you this. There's apparently uh, some of these may be gone forever. We don't know, but there's two boxes of uh, backup tapes uh, at the RNC. We're told, uh, Mr. Stern, are you aware of any uh, effort to uh, make those backup, uh, those the tapes in those two boxes available to the National Archives? Well, they wouldn't make they wouldn't make those available to us. Uh, if they were going to do a recovery effort, they would either do it themselves and then search for recover through recovered emails for, right. for official emails, or they would let some, somebody through the White House do that. Ms. Payton, are you aware of any recovery effort that has been made with respect to those two boxes? No. Uh, Mr. Swindeman, are you aware of any uh, steps that have been taken to recover uh, the emails that uh, may are contained in those two backup boxes? Uh, sir, I can't speak to the two boxes. Uh, what I can't So you don't know? I do not know as specifically as to those two boxes. All right. So there's no dispute, either on the part of the White House folks or the National Archives folks, that any emails, whether it's on an RNC account or a White House account, that may be in those two boxes. And this goes back to the 2001, 2002, and major decisions in this country were being made, uh, including uh, the decision to go to war in Iraq. There's no question that anything that relates to official White House business is subject to the Presidential Records Act. Mr. Swindeman, you agree with that? Uh, could you repeat the question, sir? Any document, email, that relates to White House business is subject to the Presidential Records Act, correct? Any document that involves uh, official business that involves right. the, the constitutional, the statutory, ceremonial um, activities of the president or the immediate White House staff is right. subject to the presidential Yeah, we're just Act. reciting the law. We're all in agreement. It's a compliance with the law question that we have. And I understand you, it's not your job, so I, I, don't, want, I don't want to be uh, asking you to do somebody, uh, somebody's job that isn't, that you to do somebody else's job, you got your hands full. But the, I guess I'll come back to you, Mr. Stern. I'm close to the end of my time. What, if anything, can you do in order that the National Archives have possession of the official communications that may be there, or what can you do to make certain that the National Archive can see that whatever reasonable steps can be taken to recover that which is available is done so that the Presidential Records Act is, com in, is complied with? Well, un under the PRA, we have no direct authority. All we can do is ask, implore, you know, and inquire. And uh, and then we also can report to the Congress. Obviously, the Congress is aware of this issue, so I think the PRA envisions that it's up to the Congress when, it, when, it, when I'm dealing with presidential records to communicate and work directly with the White House on... Okay, so here's where we are, just to sum up. You've asked and gotten no reply. You don't know, and somebody else does, but they're not here. Okay, thank you very much. I yield the balance of my time. 
gentleman's time has expired. And Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Payton, one of the uh, White House officials who uh, we contacted in preparing for today's hearing was Stephen McDevitt, who worked for you. Uh, we asked him whether there was any concern about abandoning the uh, email archiving system in O2 and relying on this ad hoc journaling process, and he said there was great concern. Uh, let me show you an excerpt from page 7 of his answers to the committee. He stated, there was a great deal of concern about proceeding with the migration of Outlook Exchange without having an adequate email records management solution in place. Uh, Mr. McDevitt described in detail the risks that were discussed within the White House on numerous occasions. One of the major concerns was the risk of data loss. He said this, the process by which email was being collected and retained was primitive and the risk that that data would be lost was, was high. Uh, the potential impact is that the system does not contain all required data. Ms. Payton, what are your views? Do you agree with your staff that the archive system was inadequate and risked uh, losing data? Uh, the, the challenge about his statement is it does predate me. Um, in talking with my staff, and, and this is also his technology professional opinion, um, in talking with the staff on our go-forward basis, we have improved the people process and technology with, with what we have to live with until we can get to a more comprehensive solution. Back at that time, um, even if you had a more comprehensive solution in place, if you don't have the right processes to make sure it's running right, you can still end up with the same result. Um, that's why we want to get to the bottom of our analysis and figure out if we still have any resulting anomalies and then make a decision around doing a restore. But to be able to comment specifically on, on things that predated me, I, I'm uncomfortable. Well, but, but, but look, it, it, it wasn't just the internal White House staff that raised the red flag about the archive system. The committee has obtained notes from a meeting on January the 6th of 2004 between staff from the archives and the White, White House. According to these notes, archive staff we're also raising these very same concerns with the White House. And the notes describe how the archive staff learned that the White House was converting from Lotus Notes to Microsoft Exchange email. Then in bold face, the note say, says this, messages in exchange are not being captured in ARMS or any other system external to exchange. The NARAD team emphasized that EOP was operating at risk by not capturing and storing messages outside the email system. Um, as you, uh, what were the best efforts um, that the White House put forward uh, when they did, did, did not heed their own warning? Um, Mr. Clay, I don't know if I have time to, um, I, I'd like to if you'd allow me to actually walk through sort of where an email travels on the system. Uh, no, because no, we don't have time for that, but okay, I, I, because we, I we will do say have this, you know, places. in your previous testimony, you mentioned that how much it's going to cost to retrieve these emails. Right. Well, you know, all of that's taxpayer dollars. And, yes, and, and, and it's like, it's, it's such a cavalier attitude that it may be 50,000 one day, 150,000 the next, but where does the care come in for taxpayer money? Well, that's part of why we want to do the analysis first, so we can have a very targeted list of if there's any anomalies at the end of the work we're doing, we'd have a very targeted list for the restore. And so by having less days to restore, we will save money as far as the restore that needs to be done. And then no one there heeded their own warnings. What was all of that about? Nobody said, I, wait I a minute, know, we, maybe we need to listen to archives. Or maybe we need to listen to our own staff. And nobody heeded those warnings. What is, what is all of that? I, I wasn't there, sir, so I, I don't know. Okay, Mr. Uh, Dr. Weinstein, do you agree that the White House process was primitive and that there was a high risk of data loss? If that is what my staff decided after looking at this process, I'd have to agree that there were some problems which deserved looking toward. 
what the nature of those problems were. I think even Ms. Payton and Mr. Swindon agreed that, that they were working on a, on a new, new platform and they just really had to, they, they didn't have all the answers. But I did want to make one point to you, Congressman, on this issue of who cares about the taxpayer. And it's, it's crucially important, particularly for the cultural institutions of the country, such as the National Archives, Library of Congress, and others, to, to be very sensitive to the fact that we can lose the support of the American taxpayer very quickly. Now, Congressman Welch, in his testimony, had, in his, his questions, had raised one question with, with Mr. Stern, my colleague here. Uh, and basically, I, I, one polite correction, I signed that letter. I, I, wrote, I drafted the final version of that letter so that if the Congressman has any interest in learning who's been trying to get the Republican National Committee or whomever to return any materials they might have, I'll take responsibility for that. But the fact of the matter is... Please, please speak up. We have, not, we, have not, we have not responded. We have not asked that question lately. We have not asked that question. We asked, we asked for the return of this last year. We periodically question people. We've just, I guess we have to be a bit stronger in our questioning, in our requests. And, well, we, and, and I will try to get doctor. some information from the chairman by the end of this week. Doctor, yeah. excuse me. You know, it seems like everyone was warning the White House about the risk of data loss. And the White House's own technical people were warning them, and your team from the archives also warned them. Correct. Yet they continued with the migration, and they continued to rely on this ad hoc process from 02 until today. What troubles me is that these are emails documenting how the Bush administration was making decisions. They are official presidential documents that the White House is required by law to save and turn over to the National Archive. They belong not to George Bush, but to the American people. But the White House seems to have ignored numerous warnings from people inside and outside the White House about its flawed approach. Uh, do you have similar concerns? More than anything else, Congressman, I want whatever materials may be in other locations like the Republican National Committee or any other location, if they're official White House documents, they belong in, with the White House, they belong at the National Archives or in preparation for coming to the National Archives. My main concern here is with the future of my, of my institution, National Archives. You know? The gentleman's time has expired. Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Payton, um, I'd like to reconcile your um, sworn uh, statements with what the committee has since learned. Perhaps you can help us. Um, on January 15, 2008, you filed a sworn declaration in the U.S. District Court here uh, regarding the loss of White House emails. And in that declaration, you criticized uh, the chart produced in 2005 showing 100 days, uh, showing hundreds of days where uh, with no White House email. And here I'm going to quote what you said in the sworn declaration. I am aware of a chart created by a former employee within this OCIO, Office of Chief Information Office. Um, now, that, of course, anyone reading that declaration would believe that a single member created staff person, created this chart, perhaps indeed almost on his own. But the committee, in fact, obtained documents showing that your office created a 15-person, what you call message storage team, to work on this problem. This team documented its actions in fairly pa painstaking detail and uh, reported frequently to the Director of Administration and White House Counsel. Ms. Payton, I, I ask you, why didn't you mention this team of White House officials in your sworn declaration? Uh, Ms. Norton, so uh, one of the things that I've mentioned before is that because this is prior to my arrival, that I um, put the information together based on what my team has told me, as well as information. So you were unaware? Are you testifying here that you were unaware yes, of this team? No. What, what I'm what I'm explaining to you is, based on what the team has told me, 
as well as information I had. There was a group of people who put data together. I'm asking but, but you, were you unaware of the message storage team that message who worked on this pro problem? And ma'am, all I knew is that they put data together. They did not work on the chart, and that's how it was presented to me. Later in your declaration, and here I'm quoting you again, you said the OCIO has reviewed the chart and has so far <clears throat> been unable to replicate its results or affirm the correctness of the assumptions underlying it. Now, we, we got a quite different account from Stephen McDevitt. He's the former White House employee who worked on this project. And this is what he said. Extensive testing was performed at that time to ensure that the tools and the tabulation process was performed correctly. An independent verification and validation also uh, was performed by a different set of contractors to ensure that this analysis process was completed correctly and that the data was correctly analyzed and accurately represented. Ms. Payton, why didn't you mention this I testing by the independent contractors? I was not, I, was, I am not aware of that testing. So You still I, are not aware of that testing? I, I am aware that Steve has made those statements. Um, we have a team that does IV and V. When I asked my staff about the chart and the validity of the chart, one of the things they said to me is, as far as they could tell, it had not gone through an extensive IVMV process. And so, so no one made you aware of it. And you, all right, Miss, this is, this is an amazing uh, testimony given the position you were in and the, the post you held. Um, now, in your, declar in, in, in your declaration, again, this is a sworn declaration. Yes, you stated that there was a, quote, lack of supporting documentation. But somebody who says she didn't know anything, you certainly had uh, something to say in your sworn declaration. Lack of supporting documentation. But Mr. McDevitt told us that the chart itself was just a summary. He said the complete analysis was 250 pages in length. It included the complete background data and trend analysis. Why didn't you mention, uh, Ms. Payton, the 250-page supporting document in your sworn declaration? That document had not been made aware to me. Um, I know that we produced a lot of documents in response to this, and so that document must not have been on the radar of my, my team to inform me. My goodness, I don't know, know how you did your job. You seem to have known nothing about it. Ms. Ms. De Ms. Payton, in your declaration, you stated that you have serious reservations about the reliability of the chart. Well, it would appear that the easiest way to get information about the chart was to talk to the person put it together, and one of those, of course, is Mr. McDevitt. In fact, this is exactly what the archives recommended to you. On November 6, 2007, Sam Watkins from the archives sent you this e email, and I'm quoting from it, Ms. Payton. It would be useful for someone to contact the original author-requesters of the chart to ask questions about its nature and meaning, the methodology used to produce it, the shortcomings or flaws you have noted, and whether they prepared any additional or related documentation. But when we talked to Mr. McDe Mr. McDevitt, he told us that throughout the entire process, you never contacted him once, even though he worked directly for you in 2006 while you were there. Why did you not contact him, Ms. Payton? Um, well, at, at that point General in time... General time has expired, but please answer the question. Oh, okay. Um, we, at that point in time when, that, um, when we were doing that analysis, we had already found flaws with the tool. And so talking uh, with Steve at that point, he probably was not aware that those flaws with the tool that was used existed. I had asked you that. I said, why hadn't you spoken directly to Mr. McDevitt? After he left the EOP? Directly with him in 2006 while you were there. Ms. Ms. Payton. He, he, um, he reported to me directly for a short time, and then he reported to the deputy director. Uh, I'm not sure I understand uh, the Ms. question. Ms. Davitt, Ms., 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 Ms. Payton, uh, the, uh, I think the, the credibility problems you present are patent here. You, you, if, if, if you did not know, then you apparently tried not to know, even when the archives told you that someone who was working for you, for you could in fact tell you 
And <laughs> again, well, Steve and I talk, had multiple conversations about records. Why and didn't the you Equinus ask project. him any of the questions I have just run down? If he if he had all of this information, sure. why didn't you inquire? Gentlelady's time has expired, uh, Mr. Davis. Did no, you? I've just I think the time yeah. expired. We need to move on. I I think that question will have to stand as. Uh, rhetorical question unless you have anything further you want to add, Ms. Payton? No, that's fine. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses. Um, just, just want to preface my questions by saying that I, I'm trying to imagine people watching this, just sort of ordinary folk watching this hearing, and I, I got to believe that they would find it completely implausible that, that this number of emails, this many days of email traffic would just disappear by accident. And I mean to imply what I'm implying. But let me ask you, um, Ms. Payton, are you familiar, I mean, I know you weren't there at the time the White House decided to abandon the ARMS system that was in place. But, I mean, you're an IT person and you kind of know this this arena. Um, have you become familiar with what that ARMS system did? I mean, do you have any understanding of kind of what the structure of it was and how it worked at all? I, I have a, a general understanding okay. um, because it exists today. It still houses the notes mm -hmm. records. Yeah. And um, it was built in 1994, and it was built actually for a, a system that preceded notes mail. Right. And then it, um, the, it had to be heavily customized so that it could interpret notes, mail's rec notes mail and be able to actually store it in arms for records keeping. Did you ever find yourself over the last year or two saying, gosh, I wish they, I wish they hadn't abandoned that system back in whenever it was, beginning of the, of the term, because things would have been a lot easier. We would have been able to collect things in a much more... Um, deliberate fashion. I mean, did you, did you ever find yourself saying that kind of thing? I mean, obviously, it would, it would be nice. I try not to second yeah, guess it would, it would people that terrific. I walk in behind. But it would yeah. have been terrific to have had that system in place. It seemed to be working uh, extremely well. And, and there's just, it's inexplicable that the White House uh, would choose to move away from that and towards this other system. If I was somebody if I were somebody who wanted to get around the system, that wanted to delete emails, um, make the record of my communications disappear, um, the system that the White House moved to would be an easier system to accomplish that with. Would you not agree compared to what had existed before? It certainly seems that way um, from the testimony. Actually, Mr. Sarbanes, it's a, it's a little bit more complicated mm -hmm. um, because when an, in, when an email comes in through exchange, um, it, it automatically gets copied over to a journal. So, for example, if you, if you were at the EOP and you were um, in the Office of Administration and let's say I was an OMB, if I emailed you automatically a copy will go into the Microsoft Exchange Journal underneath OMB and then when you get your copy it goes into the Exchange Journal as well underneath OA plus it's also in your in basket and my scent. Then when we do the PST archive your um, record that's in the OA journal moves over to the OA PSTs, the personal storage tables which are it was also another Microsoft product and then my email, which was under OMB in the OMB journal, would move over to the OMB well, PST. My, from, from so reading, you've got lots yeah, of different places that that email would be. Well, lots of different places also where human intervention could, could uh, alter the, the, the uh, recording of the information, it seems to me. But let me move away from you because I don't want to, I, I do want to applaud you for all the things you're trying to do now, but it strikes me as building a a wonderful barn and painting it a wonderful color of red and meanwhile the cow is out the barn and in a pasture somewhere given what's happened. I just wanted to ask the folks from the, um, from the archives, um, if 10 is where you want to be now in the transition on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, anticipating, you know, that we're get coming to the end of the term, where, where would you say we are from your assessment on a scale of one to ten. Let me answer that in two ways. 
You can turn on the mic. I would say that we will be at 10 by January 20th, 2009. We'll be at 10. We'll be at 10 and a half at that stage in the game. Okay, where are you now? Somewhere in between. Okay. I, I, I won't give it a number, but we're, we, we've got a ways to go. We'll get and, there. Well, I, I applaud your confidence, and I hope it's, it's well-founded because we don't want these records to be lost. The last question I had, because I'm running out of time, is we've talked about these backup tapes, the disaster recovery tapes, very apropos uh, term in this context because the loss of these emails <laughs> strikes me as a disaster, so it makes sense that they'd be called uh, disaster recovery tapes. My question is this. Um, who has possession of those? In other words, if, if we get to January of next year and the recovery process isn't finished, but there's still out there material from which you can conduct the right. recovery, where does that material go? Who has possession of that? Can you, d does the archives take possession of whatever the apparatus is from which the recovery can be conducted? I'm going to let our expert on recovery tapes deal with that one. I can describe what happened in the Clinton administration because they did have to undergo a tape restoration project that started during the administration and was not finished on January 20th of 2001. And the Office of, uh, of Administration continued to be responsible for that project. They, had a, they rented an off-site facility up in Maryland, but the legal custody of the records and, the, and in fact, those backup tapes did transfer to us. So the tapes became ours on January 20th. The records became ours. But the work was still done by OA through a contractor that we then coordinated with and helped supervise, but they still did the work. So if the same situation arose here and a recovery effort uh, starts and is not completed, I assume it will be the same case. The tapes will become our legal uh, property but still need to be worked on uh, by OA until it's complete. But we Thank have you. to stress, Congressman, yeah. that the financial responsibility we're correcting the situation is the White House's. It's not NARA's, it's the White House's. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I hope that supervision by NARA is good come, come post-January. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Platt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to yield uh, time to the ranking member, Mr. Davis. Um, thank you. Um, Ms. Payton, uh, several of the witnesses we've spoken to have said that as far as they knew, Special Counsel Fitzgerald was satisfied with the results that he received from searches performed by the White House IT employees, and none of the witnesses was aware of any plot to obstruct any Department of Justice investigation. We asked former CIO Carla Solari about whether uh, Special Counsel Patrick Fitzgerald was satisfied with the White House production, and this is what he had to say. As far as I know, now obviously I didn't have my, any first-hand knowledge with him, but through the attorneys on the White House side who were dealing with that, yeah, otherwise we would still be busy at it answering questions or there, there would have been questions come back to us that says, you know, we don't have the confidence you're providing us with everything that we've asked for. But that wasn't the case at all. McCroskey reiterated the same point regarding the plame electronic searches on at least three occasions during his interview when he said they, the DOJ, were always asking for more. And to my knowledge, the whole time I was there, we always had everything they asked for. In fact, I'm certain of it. The only thing I know is that there were no tapes missing. I do know that, and that everything that DOJ wanted, we gave them while I was there. McCroskey continued, and everything that they, DOJ, asked us for we, which was the White House IT offices, gave them. And all the feedback that I ever got was, thank you, this is a ton of stuff, we appreciate it. Now, of course, maybe it takes a long time to realize that there's a big gap in dates. Maybe that's what he's referring to. We were very concerned to do this right and make sure that he got everything that the DOJ had asked for. John Straub, who was the former uh, director of OA said of the searches. And nine times out of ten did not end up being that something was missing. It ended up being that we weren't doing the search properly or the system wasn't gathering the right information or you were searching across two systems and it would find hits in one system that it wouldn't find in another. And then you go back and refine the search terms and it found the same things. It wasn't because there were documents missing. Tim Kappen, the former CIO on the Hill at the White House and director of OA had the following conversation with staff the staff. Do you recall any concerns during that time, the whole time that you were at the White House, that these searches weren't producing all of the documents that were out there on any given subject? His answer? I remember that always, we'd always ask ourselves that. Are we finding everything? I would ask that question and have debates about it, discussions about it, about the technical parameters of the searches and of the accuracy of the billion searches that had to be created. The general answer was, yeah, we're searching everything we can and we think we've constructed the right kind of searches. 
by the look of the volume of emails we are getting, we are doing something right because we are producing an awful lot of this. Later, Mr. Campen, when asked by the staff, so you are not aware of any evil right wing plan to obstruct a Justice Department investigation particularly, he replied, no, no. Then specifically with regard to Fitzgerald, Mr. Campen said, no, I was always admonished and directed by White House counsel that this was a serious and full effort. We were always told to that the spirit of this were complying with this. Ms. Payton, I know you weren't at the White House uh, during these searches, but are these statements consistent with the documentation you have reviewed in the course of your duties? It is consistent with the documentation as well as conversations with the current staff um, because I have asked them, you know, if they know of any searches we did not satisfy and other than the one which we eventually satisfied, the Fitzgerald one, they said they knew of none. So that is consistent. And earlier when we discussed, uh, certainly with the backups, we have every reason to believe at this point that we will be able to get the, the documents we yes, seek. Sir. Isn't that correct? Uh, could you walk us through the, um, well, let me ask, um, Mr. Stern, um, um, is it true that on at least two occasions um, Sandy Berger had access to original, uninventoried, um, uncopied documents that he could have removed from the archives without detection? Uh, I believe, yes, he did have access to original documents. Okay. All right. Uh, so, okay, we have problems with, you know, records preservation at the National Archives, too. Uh, Ms. Payton, could you walk us through the process that you and your team are undertaking uh, to inventory all the White House email for each specific day? Uh, sure. Um, and I, I mentioned some of that in my opening remarks, and I'll, I'll just kind of briefly go over the beginning part of it and then give you more detail, because I, I didn't go through all the details. So um, we're in, um, from a technology perspective, um, we have three phases um, that we are undertaking. We are in the midst of phase one right now. Uh, that phase is where we introduced uh, the new um, technology where we can actually read through the personal storage tables that are on the archive and we can actually read through, read the name of the PST and from an inventory perspective associate the emails that are in that PST with the components and the dates. Um, we are also undertaking some research to look at weekends and holidays that may have low volume or zero days because there may have been maintenance going on on the weekends. And the way that would work, and this is uh, standard um, pretty much for exchange, is if you took mail servers out of rotation to do maintenance on them for the weekend, what would happen is your mail would be held. So if it was being serviced Friday night and Saturday and it didn't come back online until Sunday, you don't receive it until Sunday. Well, the old tool, tool as well as the new tool have a limitation where they can only track the received date. So it could look like you've got some messages, quote, missing, um, and you need the opportunity to be able to actually read it at the message level to see the sent and the received date. So that process is underway. We're also looking at um, the network operations logs to see if there's any documentation around outages as well. And then we, um, when we finish that phase one, we'll go through a QA process and share that with NARA um, to get, make sure they're comfortable with our methodology and our findings. Um, again, since we haven't gone through the QA process, I'm hesitant to give a lot of details um, around our findings, but I can give you some trends. Um, we have um, identified roughly nor um, somewhere in 10 million or more emails then were identified as part of the 2005 analysis using the older tools. And those were the best tools they had at the time, good workhorses. I'm not sure the team uh, knew at that time that those tools had those limitations. Um, in addition, we've been, been able to work through um, the whole entire inventory, not just for the time period in question, because we're concerned about presidential transition. We're doing from day one of exchange all the way through now, and we'll continue to do that. Um, we've also identified, I think I mentioned it earlier, roughly Ms. 13. Uh, Peyton, the time has yes, sir. expired. And, uh, we'll oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'm wondering, there's still maybe two more she could put, if you could put this back into, in, into writing, I think, if it, for the, say the committee's time, but I want to get it on the record, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I understand. Okay, that. yes, yes, because there's two more phases. And, and the third phase is actually sitting down with NARA to go over any remaining anomalies and do a. Um, well, my problem is after you're finished with your phases, you'll probably be out of office because this is uh, going to no. take a lot of time. And uh, the, the fact of the matter is a lot of the staffers mentioned by Mr. Davis in his uh, comments left the White House before you decided to abort 
the archiving system in 2006 that had been under development for three years. And after you made that decision, the White House failed to put an archiving system in place. To date, the White House still isn't, has not installed a, a new system. The bottom line is that from 2002 to 2008, the White House has not had an adequate functioning email archiving system in place. And now you've got three or four phases to try to correct the problem that has been created. Uh, I'll, I'll be happy to have you go on if, if that's what Mr. Platts wants. Well, Mr. Platts is not here any longer, but no. his time has expired. Mr. Davis, what do you uh, wish to do? You asked the question. Can, may she submit an answer to Yeah, I, you can submit it for the record. But I think the point is okay. that this is a lengthy process. This is a complicated, lengthy process, and it just doesn't jump out at you. This is not like a Google search. Thank Correct. You. And, and we have backups in this case that, that we can always get. I mean, we, we can get the records if they don't get it by a certain time. And, and Mr. Davis, our early findings indicate that if we had done a restore based on the, the older analysis that had been done, we would have restored days that we have. Let me ask you, you're, under, you're not trying to run out the clock on the committee, are you? No, sir. Okay. We, we want to transition. The, the OCIO team is very focused and dedicated on this. And, and I, I speak for them. I speak for myself. We are very energized about getting to the bottom of this and transitioning the records over to NARA. Okay, well, this is something we want to get done. The record's going to speak for itself because a long time has already gone by without getting this information. The archives is concerned about it, Congress is concerned about it, and you may not be intending to run out the clock, but I, I do think you're aware that you don't have too much time before this administration is uh, out yes. of office. Uh, Mr. Cummings, do, do you uh, want to ask some questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Be Chairman. Before you begin, uh, we have one item of business to complete. Maybe we can do it quickly. And that's the uh, motion to include in the record the interrogatories uh, by Mr. McDevitt. Uh, we had a bit of a debate earlier. Uh, Mr. Davis, do you want to say anything more well, about Well, I mean, uh, I'll, I don't know. I'll yield Mr. Issa, but I just want to just note that this, your witness that you're relying so much of your report on uh, was given. Um, I think an accord that has not been given to other witnesses that request much of the same thing. We did not have a chance to cross-examine him, and we think it would be a different record were that allowed. And we just want to put that on the record. Mr. Issa? Um, <clears throat> recognizing I still have five minutes of my own time, uh, but uh, look, you're, if you're going to put this in the record, you're going to put this in the record, Mr. Chairman, but it sets a bad precedent to take a unsworn series of statements that we can't even ask the witness whether or not those were his own statements or not. Perhaps, perhaps in fact, they were essentially pre-agreed answers uh, that, quite frankly, might, might be further fleshed out for accuracy if we had this opportunity. If the gentleman were not still a full-time federal employee uh, and for some reason was truly resisting, I would have a different attitude. But we, we bring people in front of this committee at their own expense often. This would be somebody who would be paid by the federal government to be sitting there today and I really believe that we're doing an injustice to the long-term well-being of this committee on a bipartisan basis by doing this today. I'd like to respond to you. I'm concerned about the, this committee and its long-term considerations. And as a result, uh, when we asked Mr. McDevitt to come in for an interview and he refused, we had a discussion on a bipartisan staff basis what to do because we could have subpoenaed him to come in and answer questions. Instead, uh, both sides said, let's send them interrogatories and, uh, and even let the White House review the interrogatories. And on that basis, he, he was sent interrogatories. The Republican and Democratic staff had an input into those interrogatories. And when, you, when the Republican staff saw the answers to the interrogatories, we suddenly got this complaint, well, we didn't get a chance to cross-examine him, this is not fair, and on and on and on. Uh, I, I just think that we operated in good faith. We ought to include the answer to the interrogatories in the record. Uh, and the reason that, the, uh, that Mr. McDevitt didn't want to come in in the first place is because the White House put such strong restrictions on what he could say is that he didn't feel he could even say what he needed to say in a, in a, um, in a deposition. That's how all this came about. So I would, I would ask the members to uh, support the motion to allow the interrogatories to be part of the record. Are we ready for the, uh, ready. Uh, the vote? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 The ayes appear to have it. Mr. Chairman, uh, reserving the right to question the quorum, uh, I would just like the record to 
recognize that although you have said this was bipartisan, from this particular member and uh, viewpoint and from the staff that I'm communicating with, we believe that it has not been and that this is a, 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 a form of sandbagging to deliver it. Recognizing we don't have the votes, I would uh, not assert uh, the quorum, but, but recognizing that this is not with the support of any Republicans. Well, I, I accept that. And let me say that I'm going to talk further to both staffs because we try to accommodate the Republican staff throughout this whole process. We even had the Republicans talk to Mr. McDevitt for an hour and a half, asking him any question he wanted, they, any question they wanted on Sunday night. So we have tried to be accommodating. Uh, you're, you're, you're saying to me that your staff on the Republican side does not feel that's accurate. I, I'm going to pursue that uh, with Mr. Davis because we are not trying to sandbag anybody. And, if we, if, and, uh, and I'm not going to apologize uh, to anybody because I don't feel that we have. But I wanted to, to talk to staffs with Mr. Davis after the hearing is over because I want, I want these things not to be partisan. Let's get the no. facts out and then uh, we hear obvious, obviously. Let, let me say to my friend, I, we have some uh, EPA witnesses. We hope you'll give the same uh, accounting to that you gave uh, to this gentleman. So thank you. All, uh, the, uh, the vote has occurred and the chair uh, uh, has heard uh, the uh, majority in the affirmative. Without uh, the, the chair then calls the uh, motion uh, approved by the committee and the interrogatories will be made part of the record. Uh, Mr. Cummings, you're now recognized for your five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Stern, I'd like to ask you about your perspective on the White House's effort to get to the bottom of the problem of the missing email. <coughs> the White House has known about this problem since 2005. From the time the archives first learned about it, you repeatedly tried to get information from the White House. Is that correct? Yes. Unfortunately, the archives uh, wants to know, just like we do, what caused this problem and how big it is and what the White House plans to do about it. Is that an accurate statement? Yes. The problem is each time the archives ask for an explanation, the White House promises that they have almost finished diagnosing the problem. I call it paralysis by diagnosis. <laughs> the White House says, just give us a little more time and we will tell you the results of our review. <coughs> but when the deadline arrives, the White House kicks the can further down the road. For example, in 2007, you met with the White House officials to discuss the missing emails. The White House said uh, they would tell you the full extent of the problem in one month. They didn't give you the details in June, did they? No. And at the end of June, the White House said they would get you your uh, results by the end of the summer. They didn't give you their results at the end of the summer, did they? No. In October, going further down this road, the White House said they would they have the results in six weeks. They didn't give you their results in November, did they? No. In fact, your own staff recognized the obvious pattern, and I just want to read from a summary uh, your staff prepared of a meeting between archives and the White House staff on October 11, 2007, and I want you to pay close attention to this, Ms. Pay Ms. Payton, since you said that you all were not running out the clock, or I call it rope-a-doping. Uh, and it states this. This is, a, this is the, this is the uh, statement. We should, quote, we should note that this process was supposed to be completed by the end of June, then the end of September, and the end of October in our previous meetings. They are now saying that it will take about six weeks of work to have any results, end of quote. Now, Mr. Stern, it's now February 2008. Matter of fact, we're getting ready to go into to March, and the White House still has not provided you the results, uh, the, those results, have they? No. Ms. Payton, <clears throat> it's your turn. The White House has known about this email archiving problem for almost two and a half years, and yet, despite repeated inquiries from archives and this committee, you still have not even produced a current inventory of the White House emails. Is that correct? We have, have you produced an inventory? We have one that has not been through a quality assurance process yet for us to share with NARA. So we, so it hasn't been, in other words, it's been created, but nobody's seen it beyond we, your We need to go through a quality assurance process before we share the results. And when is that quality assurance process to be, supposed to be completed? Do you well, have any idea? Well, first we need to finish all of the work in phase one. So we have a preliminary inventory. We're still doing some work um, in phase one. 
and then we'll be doing our quality assurance analysis. That should, our target, because the team and I sat down and went over this, this has been a much more complex process. Um, and if Nara will remember, when we sat down in the summer, the team very optimistically said we wanted it to be done by this time frame and estimated that it would be. It's proved to be a lot more complex um, for a variety of reasons. And so it's taken us longer because we're taking a lot of, of care and it's bigger than we thought it was going to be. Well, certainly we but, want you but to right take. But right now, but the team and I sat down and we talked about our time frame as to when we would sit down with NARA and have completed phase one and phase two. And we are targeting the summer that we'd actually sit down with them. We would have completed phase one, phase two, and have all the <coughs> remaining, if there are any anomalies left around low volume days or zero days, we would go over that with them. And what does summer mean? Give, can you give me a date? Yeah, in the June-July time frame. So, that, right. so the, fir first, the first phase, as we complete it and QA it, we're going to sit down and go over with NARA. The second phase, it'll be the same thing. We'll do a QA, go over it with NARA, and then we'll sit down and talk about if any remaining anomalies exist, what type of recovery effort needs to be done. I just want you to clear up one thing real quick. You said in your opening statement that after phase two of your study, if you found emails were missing, you would consult with archives and restore from backup tapes. Can you confirm that this will uh, be done before the end of the administration, of this I, administration? I, I cannot confirm that, and I've read the GAO report, which has said that um, the, the previous administration, it took longer than the administration. We hope with newer technology, but I just don't know the size of the recovery effort to give you an estimate to tell you whether or not it will be completed. You know, we need a sense of urgency here. We absolutely have it, sir. And it seems we, we do? Yes. Oh. We, yes, gentlemen, we, yield to me. Yes. Well, over a year ago, you got a letter from Dr. Weinstein saying you have to get going with this thing. It's going to take a lot of time. So you're, you have the possibility of going to the backup tapes and all of that. But it, he said it's going to take at least a year for you to get all this information and still we'll have nothing on the RNC tapes, uh, where there are backups and boxes. So uh, I, I just must tell you that I find it hard to believe that you have any real sense of urgency when a whole year has been uh, flittered, frittered away, whatever the word is. Oh, uh, well, I, I, we have not frittered away. I mean, we really have improved the overall inventory process, and it's something that will benefit future administrations. Yeah. As, as well as um, if we had undertaken a recovery effort prior to doing this work, we may have recovered days we didn't need to, as well as we might not have recovered days we might need to. So we really need well, to do this. Well, this all remains to be seen, but I appreciate your position. Mr. Issa, you were recognized to pursue questions, but it was under the 15 minutes that Mr. Right, Davis had. Mr. Davis so you're time. entitled to five minutes, and I'll Thank recognize you, Mr. Chairman. you for that purpose. And I'm going to follow up where the chairman left off. Uh, <clears throat> you know, Mr. McDevitt isn't here. and. Uh, it's unfortunate because there are things that, that I'm confused about, and Ms. Payton, I'm hoping you can straighten it out for us. He was the chief information officer while he was at the White House. Is that right? Excuse me? The, Mr. McDivitt was employed by the, office, uh, by the office of the chief information officer, and his primary responsibility uh, was to manage the electronic record systems of the White House. Is that right? He, he was to manage that, the new archiving okay. platform. That's correct. So, well, but essentially, he was the guy that used the tool that wouldn't see any email box that had more than 32,000 emails in it, right? So he, the tool that failed was his tool that he used earlier. Is that right? I, I don't believe that tool reported up through Steve, but I'm not sure because it was... Okay. Uh, but at the time that tool was in use, it was a flawed tool, and that was 18 more than 18 months ago. So when yeah, he says that, for example, that there are 400 days of lost information, that's wrong because he's been gone for 18 months and doesn't know. Uh, when he says that, uh, that emails could be deleted, he apparently doesn't know that there's a tracking log in the Microsoft operating system. So he doesn't know that you can't delete with impunity. That's trackable. Uh, he. Uh, uh, he obviously didn't, doesn't know that the tool that we used earlier was flawed and the tool you're using now is at least better. We'll never know if it's flawed until a later generation, but it catches many of the lost documents that, were lost, that the previous tool didn't. Is that roughly correct? That's roughly correct, yes. Okay, uh, I want to hit a couple of other points, and, and I don't want to delve too much into software, but I think it's fair that we 
recognize that software moves on and that archiving in a digital age is not as easy as it might seem to the public. And, and hopefully this hearing is good for the public to understand. Uh, the Clinton administration used Lotus Notes, right? Yes. Lotus Notes no longer exist, right? It's no longer supported. It's no longer supported. Some groups may still use it, but it's no longer supported. Right. I, I wouldn't want to do business with somebody still using Lotus Notes or still using wooden wagon wheels. Uh, if I understand correctly, though, it's, I mean, certainly I checked with the House of Representatives. We can no longer support it for members who wanted to stay on it. Uh, I assume that the robust tool you're now using to go through and recapture the uh, PSTs and de-conflict the fact that PSTs often have multiple PSTs and you don't want to have 40,000 copies of the same email, by, you know, so you have to take care of the duplicates. Those tools didn't exist for Lotus Notes in all likelihood because it was on its way out by the time the Clinton administration was on its way out. Is that roughly correct? Uh, my understanding is um, that the, the way they, because they have like a limited dedu process for arms and it had to be built. That's okay. my understanding. So here we have a situation where the Clinton administration is on a platform that has to be phased out. They're simply, they lost the war of who, who's going to supply emails. Uh, a period of time goes on in which, yes, we're dealing uh, to Dr. Weinstein's concern with you know, getting good archives, but we're also dealing with the fact that I can't play my Betamax tapes anymore either, and I can't seem to find somebody who has a Betamax player anymore. And in a matter of a couple years, it's going to be hard for me to, to play my high-definition DVDs that were on the platform that now is being phased out. This is one of the challenges that I gather for Dr. Weinstein that you face that is going to be, you know, difficult for you as an archivist going into the future, no matter who is in the White House and no matter how hard they try. Is that correct? Sure. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, certainly the House of Representatives needs to begin making sure you're funded, and that's part of what we do in oversight, funded to deal with uh, ever-evolving technologies where archiving isn't just putting it away, it's being able to retrieve it. Is that right? And to migrate where necessary. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you know, I, uh, I'm deeply disappointed, Mr. Chairman, that we, we do have a split in our otherwise bipartisan effort to deal with the, uh, the archiving and preservation of our nation's records, and particularly the Office of the President. Uh, I'm sorry that, as of today, Mr. McDevitt is not made available to us. I would hope that, in spite of the vote that occurred, that you would reconsider uh, and allow for us to bring up some of these points with a gentleman who I believe is at, at least misguided as to the tools, capability, and ongoing work by the White House as to the White House's responsibility. Last but not least, Mr. Chairman, I think what you're doing uh, is going to prove in retrospect to be shameful as to the RNC that, in fact, uh, if we have no reason to believe that, a, that private correspondence done outside of the White House is inappropriate and are not willing to do so out front, we should not have members of the White House administration here uh, in order to ask them questions about the RNC that is not within their purview. Gentlemen's time has expired. I want to recognize uh, the last questioner, I believe. But we have a lot of evidence that the RNC emails involve government responsibility because a good number of the emails from Karl Rove's account were to government agencies. We asked the RNC for the number of .gov emails from his email site, and we uh, saw that a good number of them were done. You want to assume otherwise. I'm not surprised at the, at the partisanship. I've come to expect it, but I would hope that something like this should not engender the, the, the partisanship that we've seen. The, the Republicans are attacking Mr. McDevitt, who worked at the Republican White House. You're attacking everybody else and you don't believe the truth uh, about the RNC emails, well, we'll be glad to show you the documentation we have. But we have a vote on, so I want Mr. Burton to have his full uh, five minutes, and he's recognized at this time. And I'll only use one of his minutes, but Mr. Chairman, although you spoke on, on time that doesn't exist under the, the rules of this committee, uh, I do want to continue working on a bipartisan basis. This White House will close up, and we will be looking to preserve all of the records that fall within the Act. Uh, today, I'm afraid we did not move further toward it. Uh, candidly, Mr. Chairman, uh, constantly asking about Karl Rove, Karl Rove, Karl Rove, uh, you know, who, who clearly had a reason to be 
uh, involved in many things which would have been inappropriate uh, begs the question of whether or not we have any real evidence other than, quote, we didn't find email traffic at the White House, therefore they must have been doing government work on private sites. Mr. Chairman, I have to tell you, I have little doubt that if we asked for the staff members of this committee on both sides of the aisle to provide to us all of their outside information, that we would in fact learn a great deal. Mr. Chairman, we don't have that right within this committee and we should not try to create it. I yield back to the gentleman. Mr. Chairman, we have a vote on it. I yield my time. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to make a closing comment and will afford the other side an opportunity for a closing comment. The Congress is not required under any law to, to keep our emails the way the White House has had that requirement under the Presidential Records Act. I think it's appropriate, and I hope all members of Congress would think it's appropriate that that law be adhered to, whether it's this White House or any other White House. And I must say what I've learned today, which is this hearing is about this Presidential Records Act, I'm quite disturbed. There, there, we've been asking questions about what happened to these White House emails that were sent through the RNC email accounts, they include messages sent by key advisors to the President during decisive periods of the administration. We've established there are two boxes of backup tapes stored at the RNC. These backup tapes may contain the missing emails. Uh, Dr. Weinstein, the archivist, has said that it is essential that these records be restored, yet we've learned there appears to be no effort, no effort to recover the missing RNC emails. And the only emails we want are those that relate to government business. All the evidence we've received says that these deleted emails are a vital part of the historical record of this White House, yet the White House has not asked the RNC to reconstruct the backup tapes, and it has not asked for the backup tapes so they, they uh, could reconstruct them themselves. The effect is that the historical record will have major holes. This may save the White House from embarrassment, but it is an enormous disservice to the American people that for the historical record. And there's been more effort uh, to recover the, well, there's been more to recover the missing emails from the White House I'm glad to hear that Ms. Payton has been working hard to recover these emails, and I'm glad she's found emails that were previously missing. But in this area, too, I continue to have grave concerns. There is a certain way to recover the e missing emails, that is to restore the backup tapes. The archives have been asking the White House to do this for nearly a year, but the White House won't do this. The result is that it is impossible to have confidence in what the White House is doing. We know from the Plame case that the only way the White House could recover key emails was using the backup tapes, but the White House is resisting this practical step. It's important to remember what this hearing is about. It's about, it's not about Sandy Berger. It's not about a California waiver. It's not about whether Clinton did it or didn't do whatever. It's, uh, it's important to know that this hearing is about getting a complete record of what happened inside the Bush White House. This will never occur unless the White House recovers the deleted RNC emails, but we learned today that this is not happening. It's a major disappointment and I think a clear violation of the law. And Mr. Davis is not here. I, I don't know which he one of you would. He left me to close, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, gentlemen's recognized. Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to close in the most uh, positive and, and bipartisan way possible because I believe that there was a great deal of good done here. Uh, I think we learned as a committee that, uh, <clears throat> that the statute requires adequate, according to the archivist, records. We learned from Dr. Weinstein that, in fact, we are going to, even though we're not at a 10 today, that, that regularly at the end of an administration that there is this going from a 2 or a 3 up to a 10 in the gaining of records and that there was a high confidence that we would get to that 10 by the, uh, by the state of the, or by the inauguration of the next president. Uh, I personally have no doubt that uh, Ms. Payton or a successor will be, in fact, still employed on those last few things that may need to be done in a digital age. But I'm also pleased to see the skill and the understanding, although expressed in phase, clearly that there is a process necessary to deliver all the information that is required by the archivist and requested by this uh, Congress and that we will get there, but we will get there at 
as close to or below the $15 million fee that we could spend if we simply threw everything at it. So although I share with the Chairman a disappointment that weeks, months and even a year can go by in this process, uh, I certainly will, uh, will hope very much that we all understand that it can take that long to get this information and that this is not something that is uh, devious, at least as far as I can see, that in fact Ms. Payton in good faith is, is working toward that and she has the confidence of the archivist that progress is being made and I think that is what we can take away from this hearing on a bipartisan basis I, and I yield back. That uh, concludes our business for today. I thank all the witnesses for your very generous uh, time here with us. The committee stands adjourned. In a few minutes, Senate floor debate on a bill that would end spending for the Iraq War. In a little more than 50 minutes, 